welcome freaks geeks and everything in between right now we got a few things to talk about one i gotta restring my guitar so i won't be paying attention too much but two i just want to show you some of the things that i actually listen to on my off uh, on my off time now it runs a range of weird and other parts well, something that is kind of enjoyable so wanted to share something to laugh at and some of the things to that's a little bit more of a serious topic I hope I had like a snapshot of what I tend to look at throughout the week that I want to share with everybody else. So without further ado, you know, this part is Iron Mouse. She's a... That's freak. absolute bullshit. That's absolute bullshit. You can touch your elbows to... I can't do it. Fuck. All right, guys, what are we talking about today? What exciting, stupid thing do we have going on oh, today on Food Theory? Oh, came prepared. Let's see. <clears throat> Congratulations! This video is so bad. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this video is so bad and full of misinformation. Considering how many wrong things there are in your game and film theory channels, this somehow doesn't surprise me. <laughs> oh dear, this took a turn. Thank you for being the creator to finally speak up about food theory. They put out a lot of misinformation on all of their channels. Uh, I feel like that's being a bit harsh. I, I mean, sure, Sans isn't Ness and Hollow Knight isn't the old king, but, uh, but a lot of information. It feels a bit aggressive. After seeing this, I'm convinced Matt Pat is a shill for the vegan and organic industry. <laughs> I feel like my affection for McDonald's and my love of steak would disagree, but... <laughs> sure, you do you, friend. Uh, you stole this from Brew. Similar thumbnail and content. Shameful. Oh, jeez, now we're stealing thumbnails, apparently. It's gonna be one of those days. Also, um, for the record... That is pretty interesting. <laughs> he should start out roasting himself. I think that will only make him stronger. <laughs> I actually haven't heard of the Brew channel, but I'm absolutely going to look it up. I personally suggest you take down and or remake a video about this topic again. It would have actually been a good video if you did some sort of research. You know what? Uh, comment, I can actually agree with that one. A good video does do good research, and I would say 99% of the time, I feel pretty darn confident about the research that me and the rest of the team does when we're working on these episodes. Uh, that said, you know, sometimes things slip through the cracks, but rarely is it something major enough to take down a whole video. So, you know what? Let's do it. Let's look at this toxic information that we put out into the world and see if it holds up or not. Have I actually lied to you? Today, let's decide the fate of a video. Does it remain? That's interesting. That would be an interesting series altogether. A video providing nothing but facts and evidence, and if it stands on its merit, it stays, and if it doesn't, it fails. That sounds like an interesting freaking series, let alone a single episode. I'm gonna put my gorilla thumbs together for something. Hold on. Huh. Hold on. I think I'm gonna find this the hard way. Where I didn't need to. 
hold on. I'll be right back. I need some wire. I need one of those pliers or something. Maybe some dikes. Remain up online, or should we be taking it down? No intro today, friends. Let's just hop into it. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Food Theory, the show right, that man. apparently lies to you, needs to do more research, is a shill for veganism, and apparently steals thumbnails. Now, if you need a context for any and all of that, back in February, we covered the milk industry on this channel, exposing the propaganda machine that gets people to keep consuming dairy products, despite the fact that the majority of humans on planet Earth are biologically programmed to become lactose intolerant in adulthood. Then, about a month ago, a video popped into my feed by the channel, how to Cook That, hosted by food scientist, dietitian, and published cookbook author, Anne Reardon. In short, this is someone who knows her stuff when it comes to food and has made a name for herself debunking popular food videos online. Which is why I trembled in fear when her name got mentioned in the video. And uh, let's just say that my reaction wasn't entirely unwarranted. There are so many videos out there already that say stop drinking dairy, including this one from Food Theory, which is very, very similar in the look of the thumbnail and the content of the video to this one that was from Brew two years earlier. Oh, the subtle suggestion of plagiarism. We are starting off real strong. Here's the thing, regarding the thumbnail, it's a calcium meme. Skeletons, strong bones. We knew that we wanted to riff off of the whole calcium meme thing and we wanted skeletons holding or drinking milk. And like I said, none of us were actually aware of that other video. I, I, I can't expressly prove it, but I was in every thumbnail discussion. Hours of my life wasted and no one once brought it up. So it's just coincidence. Great minds think alike. Uh, though I will say looking up the brew channel now, this definitely seems to be a channel that is up my alley. Uh, the tagline, Solving Mysteries One Cup at a Time. Ooh, I think I found my new favorite YouTube channel for the next month. From that auspicious start, her video is spent responding to common questions that people have about the dairy industry in general, ranging from the environmental sustainability of dairy farms to the environmental impact of dairy alternatives. That's interesting. I didn't know that the, that the woman existed either. I might have to look her up in her specific... Uh, contributions to humanity not to say that no person exists like that it's just uh, partially selfish curiosity more than anything else and uh, well if I know the information if I know the information for myself nobody can tell me a lie for another so it's it's already starting off on a good foot, even though I probably won't forget about 90% of most of this junk anyway, due to the applicability into my own life that it, this may or may not have. So, like, it only has so much staying power, is what I'm trying to get at. 
And I'm not gonna go into detail about any of that stuff because it wasn't a focus of our original video. Those are different topics for a different day. I am here specifically to address Anne's concerns to food theory, which honestly only account for around three and a half minutes of her video's total 20 minute runtime. And a lot of that time is actually spent agreeing with us. For example, Anne mentions the nutritional benefit of calcium for growing kids. No one is debating do kids need calcium for their bones to grow. In fact, studies have shown that if you don't have enough calcium, you won't grow as tall as if you have enough calcium. And yeah, she's right. Nobody's debating this. In fact, we made the exact same observation in our own video. Well, it turns out that milk does have a few clear-cut benefits. For one, milk has been clinically shown to make children grow taller. Not kidding. It's estimated that if you add an additional serving of milk to a child's diet every single day, they may add a full centimeter to their final adult height. One of the big points that we focused on in the last milk video we did here on Food Theory is how it's after childhood that consuming milk becomes more complex. And again, it's something that Anne agrees with. Here is our video. And a mother's milk, with its complex mixture of nutrients, vitamins, proteins, beneficial bacteria, antibodies, and lymphocytes, act as a literal power shake for babies. And the thing is, by the time people hit 20, our bodies are designed to no longer produce enough lactase to break down milk. And here's Anne saying basically the exact same thing. Now, most people have that enzyme. They make it in their bodies when they're babies because they need to be able to absorb the breast milk that they're being fed. And then as they get older, the amount of that enzyme can decrease. There's only about a third of people in the world who that enzyme doesn't decrease. Outside of tracking the history of lactose intolerance, the rest of our video was basically dedicated to the advertising practices of the milk industry. How pro-milk ads that are designed to look like public health announcements actually come from private organizations whose funding mostly comes from milk producers. And our little expose on the milk industry's marketing tactics, which really was the meat and potatoes of that episode, isn't something that Anne disputes. In fact, of our entire 14 minute long episode, the only part that she wound up disagreeing with were two sentences right at the very end. A total of 37 words out of a total 2,600 word script. In a paragraph where I briefly review alternative ways of getting calcium, I say this. Green vegetables like broccoli and kale, more calcium than milk. If you hate green things, just try eating some beans. You know, those fun little round guys that come in burritos and chili, more calcium than milk. This is the part that she clips out and reacts to, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but first, it's worth noting all the stuff around it that she cut out, because here's the rest of the clip. Tofu, also a primary source of protein and calcium in places in the world where lactose intolerance is high, and it's both cheaper and healthier than milk. You know what else has the nutrients of milk in a pinch? a good calcium supplement, and a vitamin D drop from the grocery store or pharmacy. And these she doesn't dispute because, honestly, there's no disputing them. These are better alternatives to drinking a glass of milk, but clipping out the ones that we definitely got right. Vitamin D is important, is important but I'll say if you can drink milk at a late, late stage of your life or past adulthood, I mean good for you that's that's one more resource that you can use for the freaking betterment of your own body so i don't see what the big problem is i guess like freaking big brain intellectuals fight using big words to make themselves look i guess better to each other or to their I don't know. It's just like this isn't really worth fighting over type of thing for me. Like I, I got better stuff to worry about. Like are my kids going to get drafted in the next war or something? Uh, and I think I fucked up. over into here. <sighs> Hold on.
You can do that with out of flash and get uh, as long as you color balance the same uh, the same area and get the proper exposure using the tripod. They did a bad picture. For Yeah, I strung it up wrong. Okay. Back to... And not acknowledging them makes it seem like our video was irresponsible and full of a bunch of misinformation, when again, none of it was actually the focus of the episode in the first place. But, okay, let's just get back to her main point. The stuff about kale, broccoli, and beans. Here's Anne's take. They say in their video that broccoli and kale have more calcium than milk, and they show a picture of cabbage, not kale. Ew, yikes, yeah, that's a that's a big oof there. We definitely deserve every hit for that one. It was totally our bad. We even had our resident vegetarian review the episode, and even she didn't catch it. It's not an excuse. Just slipped through the cracks of everyone watching the episode. But honestly, that visual mistake isn't the main point. It's not why people are calling for the removal of our video. It's the possible misinformation that was contained within that section. So let's actually review that, shall we? Okay. So let's do a yeah, so like this, this video isn't exactly a removal video. It's just a, I guess, a beef between two big brains having a freaking brainstorm argument. Uh, I, I don't get it, but I, I get the point, I get the point uh, versus misinformation and what other people will say that your inf the information from food products are put out, but again, I think it's, I think this is pointless. Uh, this part of it is pointless at best. I mean, the food graphic aside, that's not really a big issue. Like misinformation uh, and the misinformation angle would have been far better to a uh, far better thing to focus on and to correct. But if she agreed with everything but a couple of sentences of what she put out, there's no point in having a valid, of a valid discussion or argument or whatever, because it just serves as fuel for the fire, in my opinion, against people that don't mean you any good to begin with. But that's just my opinion. And besides, pay attention to the people that don't mean you any good from jump. Well, not the quality of your life will take away from it. So your best bet is to actually not ignore them for not ignore them because what they what they do or say can have an effect on what you can do in your life and I'm not going to ignore that because people are just People are just bad, okay? They will attack uh, freaking anything sitting still long enough in a lot of cases. And in other cases, you're better off just protecting your own interests and making sure that you're in the best position possible. Now, in regards to the information being put out here, I would say Take in the information, take notes, and do your own research so that you are well informed. Not relying on people that actually make a living off of informing people about their takes. So, like, sharing information is always good, especially if you can use it against, uh, you can use it against somebody that you may not necessarily see eye to eye with at the moment. Because it leaves an avenue for you to not only correct 
fear in yourself, but uh, make yourself better over a period of time. Now, this isn't true for everybody because a lot of people like to stand their ground no matter what, so to speak, and never think or assume that they're wrong because they'll just double down harder and harder. I'm going to be honest with you. Assume that you made a mistake and be willing to correct it if the opportunity arises. If you didn't, nothing needs to change and continue with your life as normal. I think he just took like a lot of internet uh, a lot of internet heat personally so he feels the need that he has to make videos like this. Nothing wrong against that. But at the end of the day, you know, all these people on the internet have too much of a head, uh, take up too much headspace on MatPat, in my opinion. He should not be afraid to live his own life. No matter what mistakes that he have made, he has the intelligence to move on and do better. And he should be able to give that same type of uh, leeway elsewhere. A comparison. To get that 300 milligrams of calcium that you get in one glass of milk, you would need to eat 222 grams of kale. And you might think, that's easy, I eat that much in a day. But I can guarantee if you put that in front of a child, that is a lot of kale to get them to eat, especially if they need more than one serve of dairy in a day. That's quite a lot. Let me interrupt to say that she is definitely right about kids not wanting to eat this amount of kale. As a father of a three-year-old, he'd sooner eat a Lego than a leafy vegetable. That said, <laughs> though this provides a powerful visual as like, wow, look at all this kale, it actually condenses down quite nicely into like smoothie form. And then goes on to explain that we're technically correct about kale having more calcium than milk if we're talking about calcium per gram. Now, technically, gram for gram, this has slightly more calcium. Aha! Technically correct! The best kind of correct. However, she then goes on to suggest that rather than comparing a gram of kale to a gram of milk, it would make more sense to compare a single serving of kale to a single serving of milk. And if you do the comparison that way, well, milk comes out on top. But to say that it has more calcium than milk is a bit deceptive because a serve of kale is not this much kale. If you're looking at serve to serve, milk has a lot more calcium in it. This is actually a great point to bring up, and it's it's something that I've been meaning to talk about on the channel for a while now. Talking about food amounts is, it's complicated to say the least. For instance, say you wanted to compare the number of calories in a glass of milk versus a can of Coca-Cola. Well, let's do it and suggest it and compare one serving size to one serving size. After all, it's printed right on the label, so it should be easy enough to do, right? So one serving of this 2% milk has 130 calories, while the nutrition label on our can says this can, one serving size, has 140 calories. This acidic sugar water is obviously more caloric than milk, right? As you might expect, this is supposed to be really unhealthy for you. But wait a minute, let's look at the numbers again, because here's the thing, the nutrition label for the milk is based on a serving size of 240 milliliters, one cup or around eight fluid ounces. The can of Coke, meanwhile, is based on this single can, 355 milliliters or 12 ounces, very different. In other words, a regular 12 ounce can of Coke has more calories if you're comparing it to an eight ounce cup of milk. If we do some simple arithmetic, we can actually see that if we were comparing one cup of each fluid, that would actually come out to the milk having 130 calories, like we knew, and the Coke actually coming out less, 93 calories less than the milk. I do this that's little comparison not as a means. That's because the sugars in milk are complex. They're not simple sugars, but they're easily broken down to be simple sugars. Okay? That. <laughs> 
Bad Pat got a point. <laughs> the freaking measurement system and um in the grocery store is bonk. That's why they ha- that's why they have to use uh standard or me- uh, standard or metric uh, measurements to go along with it so that you can you can you have something to go by when you measure measure out your food but yeah it's a crazy system ends up saying like oh coca-cola is healthier than milk obviously it's not it's like acidic sugar water it's terrible for you they have vastly different nutritional content i'm just using this to illustrate a point here one serving is not always the same as one serving and that's even true when you're comparing identical food products case in point look at the nutritional content for this 20 ounce bottle of coke here it defines the entire 20 ounce bottle as the single serving leading to completely different numbers than when we were looking at at just the can itself. I could certainly name more examples, but hopefully you see my point here. If you use one serving as the basis for a comparison, it's easy to end up with distorted pictures because serving sizes are just defined inconsistently, especially when you're comparing foods across different food groups like a... Uh, I, if I remember correctly, serving size is dictated by whoever sells the product. like saying that a hamburger is same no matter where you, no matter where you go the com- the components may be the same but the sizes of the burger can be vastly different oh hello so that's a good point leafy green vegetable and a beverage and a lot of times the serving size has more to do with what it's been packaged in than the actual amount of stuff that you're getting i mean sure one serving or a cup of milk has more calcium than one serving or a cup of kale but the kale has fewer calories comparing one cup of leafy green vegetable to one cup of nutrient rich liquid isn't exactly a one-to-one comparison either so for our information we tried to standardize that comparison as much as possible and since a gram is a gram is a gram no matter what you're talking about we compared a gram of milk to a gram of raw kale and beans, only to find that, yeah, the kale and beans had more calcium per gram than milk. We didn't even try considering serving sizes and portion sizes because, well, we didn't really think to. We didn't think we had to. We were just focused on the cleanest possible comparison. But obviously it takes a lot more kale to make up a single gram, which winds up giving you that big, massive plate of kale like she pulls out in her video. So, If you're looking at serve to serve, milk has a lot more calcium in it than kale. So, which one of us is right? Well, the answer is both of us. We were just using different systems of measurement. And mind you, these aren't even the only two ways to look at the situation. For instance, we could be looking at the amount of calcium per calorie. Would that be a better way of measuring calcium content? Uh, This is the sort of thing that comes up all the time when you're asking questions like, how much of ketchup is actually garlic powder? Or how much of this condiment is added sugars? You'll come up with different answers depending on whether you're calculating by the weight, by the volume, or where the calories are actually coming from. Calling this sort of thing an apples to oranges comparison isn't doing it any sort of justice because we're literally just comparing a food to itself and we're just using different modes of measure. And if all of that wasn't complicated enough already, you have the added layer of bioavailability to consider. Now, I've mentioned this before during our spinach episode, but the long and short of it is that just because a food contains a certain amount of nutrient doesn't necessarily mean that your body is able to use all of that nutrient. Case in point, spinach, absolutely packed with iron, but studies show that in some cases you're only getting about 2% of that able to be absorbed into the body. A pittance compared to what you'd actually get from other foods like, say, steak or even dark chocolate, which have it in a form that's much more bioavailable. So even when we have what seems to be like a perfect one-to-one comparison, one milligram of iron is not the same thing as one milligram of iron depending on the food source. And likewise, one milligram of calcium is not the same as one milligram of calcium. So Since neither Anne nor I explicitly talked about this in our respective episodes, let's do it now, shall we? According to Dr. Connie Weaver, professor of food and nutrition at Purdue University, who literally wrote the book on calcium and human health, 
I have a digital copy of it, so I'm pretending to hold a physical copy of it. Can we just After Effects this in? Awesome, thanks editors. Now let's After Effects it off because I'm done introducing it. Great, there it goes. Our bodies can absorb about 32% of the calcium inside of milk, whereas calcium inside of vegetables is gonna vary wildly. Worst case scenario, we're talking about spinach. <laughs> which continues to get dunked on in our episodes because only about 5% of that calcium is bioavailable. But for other brassica vegetables, the family that includes kale and broccoli, that number is actually significantly higher than milk. Broccoli, for instance, can get as high as 60%. That is nearly twice the amount that you're gonna be getting out of milk. And that makes all the difference in the world when you're comparing the calcium in both of these. Mm. I don't even know how they thought that broccoli had more calcium than milk because it doesn't even gram for gram. I'm not sure where they got that from. Since you asked, let's actually get to where that information came from. According to the University of California San Francisco Medical Center, one cup of milk has 300 milligrams of calcium, just like Anne points out in her video. Well, the same amount of cooked broccoli has 180 milligrams of calcium, which at first blush would seem to support what Anne is saying. Milk has more calcium than broccoli. However, let's now apply the numbers that we brought up when discussing Dr. Connie Weaver's calcium research. Of the calcium that's produced in both of these, 108 milligrams of calcium would be coming into your body from the broccoli, while you would only be able to absorb 96 milligrams of calcium from the milk. So the broccoli ultimately wins out per serving. Another reason we might have actually come to different conclusions here is that we might just be looking at different sources which is why I'm trying to be specific about where our numbers are coming from. The numbers from the USDA website actually are different, but they're talking about raw broccoli instead of cooked. In my research, I also discovered that the reported calcium level for broccoli tended to vary based on the source that you were looking at. And one reason for that, I suspect, is that the nutritional content varies based on whether you're talking about the florets, the very top, versus the stalk or the stem. So, yeah, I don't think that we were wrong in this case. Even if we do, as Anne suggests, and compare one serving of broccoli to one serving of milk, looking at the amount of calcium that our bodies can actually absorb from each of these food sources ultimately means that broccoli beats milk. Even if Anne is technically correct about milk having more calcium in it. Now, I don't bring any of this up to say that Anne was wrong on a particular point. Like I said, she is technically correct, just like she said I was technically correct about the gram for gram stuff. The best kind of correct. But I think all of this illustrates an important point. When it comes to nutrition and food science, it is really hard to tell the full story. Even bioavailability can change based on the foods that you're eating together as part of a meal. If you mix citrus in with spinach, it's a whole new ball game. Even directly comparing food labels doesn't paint you the full picture because our bodies just process different foods in different ways. The TLDR of this whole video is this. On food theory and across all the theory channels, I and the rest of the team do our research. We do a lot of research, and I hope that this episode has shown you a little bit of that. And so when people say that we don't do our research, we take that very seriously. And in doing that research, we do our best to find a balance. We try to make sure that we're giving you information that is true to the best of our knowledge, but also useful. I always do my best to include the facts that I think are going to paint the full picture for the narrative, but also there are just limits in how thorough we can be in any given video. Case in point, look at what we're doing right now. We're wrapping up a 20 minute response video, responding to a three and a half minute segment from another channel that in turn was reacting to a 20 second clip of our original video. I mean, that 20 second clip of offhanded comments has suddenly ballooned into this 20 minute spectacular f Remember what I said about people taking up too much headspace and you're freaking allowing them to live rent free in your brain That's exactly what I'm talking about. You think about it too much and it isn't doing you any good They ain't paying rent for you thinking about it inside of your head man Get the fuck out of here Move on. He brought up several points that'll work good, mind you. So, like, it's a good response, but I get the air of um, taking this shit personally. So, yeah. Let him take it personally. It isn't your problem that you need to deal with, man. It's theirs. And I'm down to my last, my last, last, last string. Damn it. Got to 
do it over again. It ain't gonna sit right if I got it all but one that's done correctly. Oh well, back to the food theory. Full of nutritional science and food labeling. If we went one inception level deeper, I'd be like, I don't know, I'd be like doing a 90 minute dissertation on bioavailability, which something tells me no one is gonna have the patience for. So am I taking down that original video? No, I don't think we need to. Did I lie to you or purposely misrepresent information? No. Would it have been better for me to compare serving sizes like Anne suggested rather than weight? You know, I don't know. I, I'm still not sure on That's that. That's argument. But will these sorts of things happen again? Yeah, honestly, most likely. As I said, food is just a subject with a lot of nuance and a shocking amount of misinformation out there. But I am more than happy to sit down on the couch and do response videos like this one, trying to clarify all of this as we continue to figure out the best way to cover the complicated world of food. And rest assured, there is absolutely one thing I feel confident in promising you. I will never again make the mistake of confusing this cabbage with this kale. But hey, that's just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. Kale to the camera. Bottoms up. All right. I think that was a good theory. Uh, not theory, but food theory show. But again, it shows that it really does read too much into the common. Ingies, what you got? Anything good? Some crew, perhaps. Um, there's really nothing to do here. Solid. Shh. Nothing, and there go the engines. I mean, we could just go more ion. Sir, okay. Have an ion party. More that. ion dudes. I actually got that. Yeah. Just saying, but this one, or this one's kind of better. It it's five sec or seven seconds is supposed to five, but it does two ion damage. This only does one. I don't really have the money to do most of this stuff. Sell that. Um, sell the <laughs> It's $15. Yeah, that's not great. They don't even have drone control. They have drones, which I wouldn't mind buying drones, but they don't have drone control. So I'm going to sell this drone. I'd rather have the 30 bucks. Do I I kind of want, so I want this. I want. And there's a breach in there, so now helping to fix that room. Turn a gun off. Not really interested in watching somebody else play a video. Wife was going hard with cousin and got pregnant. Oh. Divorce time. All right, it's a long one, so bear with me. Know? This situation happened about two weeks ago, and I've gone from fully trusting her to I deeply bet. doubting her. My wife and I met when I was 19, and we fell in love quite quickly. She had a four-month-old child from a previous relationship. That father hasn't been in the picture since I've known her. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a father. But I have a genetic disorder I don't wish to pass on, so adoption was just great with me. Anyhow, we've been just like your normal family every day since then. We got married last year. She was never super close with her family, but she did have a pair of cousins she was always kind of close to and I had lots of fun getting to know them and they seem like decent people. She did mention that one of them, Max will call him had when they were like 12 and 13 tried to kiss her but she ran off. I asked her if she ever told anyone and she said she chalked it up to him being a stupid kid. We see him on Christmas every year and he seems like a normal dude. I actually liked him as her family is a bunch of stuffed shirts and he's down to earth. Recently they've reconnected and gone to a few family functions. We own one car and since I needed it for work he picked her up and drove her to these things. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary about this, they are cousins after all. Her behavior really didn't make any obvious changes. However, randomly, as I was watching TV one night, she came in and mentioned that I had friended a girl from my place of work. I accepted a friend request. 
we're a pretty open couple and things don't usually offend us. For instance she'll remark on an attractive guy and make some sort of lewd remark and I think nothing of telling her this woman was the new office. She didn't accuse me of cheating but it felt like she was about to which has never happened before. The reason I mention this is because I've read cheater accuse their partner as a projection or something. Anyway, these family outings were legit. The whole family posts pics on them on Facebook and the wife sends pics from the outings. There were two of these events and each time wife came home and was like a robot. S time seemed normal if not quieter than usual but as she suffers from depression she often gets cold every so often and when I asked her if she was doing alright she chalked it up to that. Well two weeks ago she leaves for work and as it was my day off I puttered around the house, dropped the boy off at school and came home to check my email. On Facebook I saw that I had a message from her cousin. He and I had recently discussed going out to see a farm team baseball game and I thought he was getting back to me. The message reads I'd like to see you on your knees. I was confused as heck until I realized that my wife was still signed in and it was her he was talking to. I wanted to kill him. I instantly rushed and read through their chat log and it's filled with him creeping on her, and while she is saying things like but I'm married. And no I'm married. These read like very thin nose like she is saying no because she has to not because she wants to. I'm disgusted and absolutely floored about it. But since none of them mention anything happening yet and she is denying him albeit kindly, I can't exactly say she's cheating. Well when she gets Creepy home and our son play. is put to bed I confront her over the situation she instantly breaks down into hysterics and tears. Saying things like I didn't do anything, I didn't know how to tell you. I was just hoping he stopped. Now she and I both suffered childhood as time will abuse from family friends, we've both went to years of therapy for it and for that reason we have very good communication skills when it comes to comfort and boundaries and how to express ourselves about unwanted advances. I love her, and I wanted to believe her and that he was just being a creep but the way she didn't tell me and acted seemingly normal leads me to believe something else was going on. I told cut. her that I believed her and asked her if I could message him to tell him to back off and how disgusted I am that they are cousins or if she would prefer to tell him and handle it herself. She first expressed that she would tell him that I knew and not to call her, but her resolve cracked as she was confident this would just stop. I was furious about that, but didn't express it and told her that knowing she wasn't going to I was going to give him a peace of mind. This is my wife, if she's being harassed I will end it. And if she's not being harassed she's cheating on me so I messaged him. He saw it but made no reply. The wife says I should have let her handle the situation. And I told her there was no way I was going to keep quiet in the face of this. She seemed to understand and expressed in the end that I was probably right to confront him because she didn't know how. All seemed to return to normal, but three days later I come home and she's crying. I ask her what's wrong and she said it's Max, you should have let me handle it. I messaged him yesterday and he won't talk to me. We had the conversation again about me not sitting idly by when somebody is harassing my wife, she gave me a look, it wasn't much and it was only for a second, but it gave me the impression that she didn't consider it harassment. We end the discussion in agreement that I handled it how any man would handle it. Two days later I'm coming to bed late like 2am as I was finishing up some work. I hear her on the phone with somebody kind of chuckling. This is not normal. Told me it was her mom and had something to do with our kid's birthday which I didn't buy, but at this point, I've begun playing stupid so I can observe the situation from a place where she feels comfortable. The next day she is crying again and at this point I've really had it, she's been unstable for two weeks now. When I ask her if this is about Max again she says she tried to call and apologize for not handling the situation herself and that he still isn't talking to her. I admit it, I snapped. I, I told her that either he was abusing her or she was cheating on me and I caught them. Won the couch tonight obviously. I wanted to believe her, but I'm not a moron. I'm essentially laying here with my finger on the button waiting for some solid truth because if this is what it's feeling more and more like, I'm about to go 95,000 megaton nuclear on the both of them. Sorry for the length, I just don't know what I can do, do from it. here on out. Edit, thanks for all the input. She goes to work in six hours. I will apologize for my outburst and ask her to sit down with me and talk tonight. It's Sunday and our son typically stays the night with my parents every other Sunday. I'm not proud of it, but I feel it's in my best interest to do a snooping. 
If I find nothing we will discuss what happened when it started, what I can do to help her, and what we ought to do moving forward. I love her, and the idea that she is being harassed by somebody who is supposed to love her breaks my heart. However, if I do find something sorted, or learn that she was complicit in any way, I am done with the relationship that instance. I, I don't done. believe in marriage counseling and instances of infidelity and even if I did incest. There is no way I could look at her the same again. We'll update, update. So I didn't sleep at all last night and when she woke up I made breakfast. I told her I shouldn't have blown up and that we should probably sit down tonight and talk about things. She agreed like she wasn't even upset, to begin with, and said she knew she had probably been acting badly. I told her that the sort of harassment she was dealing with was infinitely more difficult because he is a member of the family. She just seemed to agree with me, I wasn't going to snoop, but so many people on here told me I ought to, and not wanting to be accused of not taking the advice I asked for, I decided to go through with and check her emails. With the way she was acting this morning, I had fewer reasons to be suspicious, but at this point what the heck, and did just no. that, the level of disgust, hatred, and anger I feel cannot be expressed right and there will be a divorce. There was one email entitled yummy and upon opening it I found a picture of her cousin with semen on his face. The back and forths are him describing to her his encounters with random gay men. They make reference to past s time ool encounters they've had together complete with one picture of a strap on dildo captioned I still have our old friend. Then I read some absolutely disgusting filth talk between oh, them where she is behaving in a very man. dominating they way and insulting his penis <laughs> size. Looking at the dates I realize that this was from a year ago. As I continue to read I'm able to figure out at least from how it reads that they used to hook up frequently but stopped after we got married. We were together for several years before we got married. Later she starts using the I'm married excuse, but it's reading like that's just a kink of his, to be told he can't touch her anymore which he probably does. I'm raising her fucking kid and she does this to me. I've wasted the last six years changing my work schedule and not taking better paying jobs because I need hours where I'm able to watch him. I went outside and sat on the front porch, called my brother over and after explaining to him the entire situation asked him to take my gun from me for the time being. I'm not a violent person, I never have mm. been, but in the state I'm in now I'm fluctuating between wanting to kill him and wanting to kill myself. I'm not going to, but I feel like I'm headed for a break. Whenever you feel like that, never be alone. Always talk to somebody and get help. Get, get, get help. Do I need to put it on a remix? Always get help. Never be alone and don't stand alone. With that said, I might keep this pause just for an extra period of time because I need to find my tuning app. And tune. Use default.
next one is going to be D3, which... It's a little off, but it's within an acceptable tolerance. So let's see. This right here. No. G3. Ninety five hertz. There we go. Let's see B three. Two forty seven hertz. It's like it's still tightening. That sounds way too low. Like it's too high. Finally got it right, though. Well, I just did it. The strings are going to need to relax. A little bit then I'm gonna to need to tune it again ever so often just to keep it in just to keep it in tune so like the first tuning is done after restringing just gonna to need to keep in mind to keep 
tune in it until it gets to a good rest. I'm not dealing with any pins, unfortunately, because pin, to me, a uh, pinned guitar is better than uh, than the tie-on tensions. But a guitar is a guitar if you know how to use it. So the pinned ones are more expensive but easier to maintain in my opinion so let's get back to the story that went past Alabama breakdown and I can't trust I'll behave rationally mm. after this I'm packing up my clothes and checking into a hotel these conversations have all been printed I've sent copies to myself yeah, boy. And when I have time I'm digging for more dirt bought a pack of cigarettes Stopped smoking four years hey, ago. Sweets. And Joy, I have to make an appointment at some STD clinic because according to these fucking vile back and forths, a part of his thing is having unprotected S time with these men. My soon-to-be ex-wife has a device and as such I've never once in all these years worn protection with her. So now I apparently have months of biting my fucking nails to look forward to as I understand AIDS tests take months. I know his work schedule roughly because I used to work for the same company he does. So maybe before checking in and composing myself, I'm just going to drive down to see his wife evidence in hand. There's no fixing this. There's no therapy, no hope, nothing positive, And I don't care to even entertain an apology. I'm divorcing the W or, and she will get nothing. I hate life right now. I don't feel depressed or sad. I haven't cried. I just have this hot ball of rage in my chest that the cigarettes only briefly cool. I can't be near her or him. I know I said I'm not violent, but man, I really want to beat the piss out of both of them. Update. You're violent. This one is exceedingly <laughs> long. I'm getting out all of my thoughts and well, there are a ton. The TLDR bullet points. I will get weekend custody. My marriage was a sham cover for an incest affair. HIV test is negative. Working together with ex-wife for a quick divorce. Neither of us are wealthy so all we have to divide is two checking accounts and utility bills. We're in agreement on what belongs to who and who should pay what. Falling for the other survivor but not acting. Because apparently I'm stupid enough to catch feelings in a time like this. But not stupid enough to ruin myself any further by pursuing her. So, first of all I'd like to say thank you for the gold and the hugs and the support from this community. I think I got the advice and input I was looking for and at this point. I'm just doing another update so I can sort out my thoughts in a semi-public way so random strangers can call me out on my Beal shit. I do listen and I do take what everyone said to heart or at the very least consideration. So the link to my original posts is above, but I'll give you a TLDR anyway because like the first two, this will probably be quite lengthy. Okay. A few weeks back I found texts of a S time rule nature on my wife's FB from her cousin. She claimed this just happened and she wished he would stop. I messaged him never to speak to her again under the pretense that this had been an unwanted advance. Turns out it wasn't. Turns out they've been s timely involved since 14 or 15. Divorce happening. Okay, well a bunch has happened since the day or two days since my last update. First the good news, I got my HIV rapid test and it came back negative. Thought it would take days or months but literally learned in the same visit. I am going to get tested again obviously in the next few months and for now I'm going to live my life as if I do have it just to be extra careful. Max's wife, who I'll be calling Sherry from now on, accompanied me for support, her own appointment is in two days. Well, I had the first long sit down with the soon to be ex-wife. We had an understandably explosive sit down earlier in the week and we've talked sparsely in between. I left this out, but I've been calling her at my son's bedtime to say goodnight to him. At the moment he is under the impression that I'm just working a lot. Planning on telling him the truth in the following days or truth good enough for a six-year-old. Reconciliation was never on the table, she knew this. Go, what's wrong you? It, which I was thankful for. Her reasons shouldn't concern me, they can't benefit me in any way. But giving myself to emotions for the moment I asked her to be truthful and tell me how long it's been going on and why, or if I did something that would push her to this. She looks like she's been crying on and off but she was <laughs> talking with me about it. And by how candid she was I can tell it's probably the truth and she's somewhat relieved to be talking about it in a weird and fucked up way. 
Long story short, she's the instigator. She didn't say as much, but you she's didn't, in love me. with him, and they aren't together because obviously. I'm learning now Better that stop. I'm basically the equivalent of it's one of those sham wives that gay men would marry so they could seem normal but pretty crushing. She insists she loved and loves me, but I don't believe it nor does it matter anymore. My life for the past six years was a lie, probably just a cover for this Beale shit. I don't know if I even know what real love, romantic love looks like and that's got me more than a little fucked up. She looked hurt seeing me hurt, but I don't know if it was real, not that it matters anyway. The important thing we discussed was my stepson and what we will do moving forward. Before I could say anything she told me she wouldn't oppose something like weekend custody and would sign that in the divorce. I honestly think she is extremely remorseful about how this affects him. A lot of telling me I am his father, his only dad, and taking me away from him would be so damaging. We're going to tell him the bad news in a few days. Tomorrow or today whenever I post this, I'll be taking him to the zoo. I was thinking of telling him after that, but he loves this zoo and I really don't want him thinking of his parents' divorce every time he sees it. It's tearing me up having to think of a way best to scar my child for life. I'm thinking about how to make it positive, like telling him how in my new apartment he'll have a new room and he can paint it how he wants and help me get stuff for it. Make him feel like he and I are a team like a way to make this terrible shit fun. We aren't wealthy. So basically, we're just going to keep what we have in our already separate accounts, divide up the remainder of our utility bills in a fair way, and just get the divorce. We discussed meeting at the courthouse and having me file divorce right in front of her so she can be served that minute. I want it over as fast as possible and seeing as she's giving me the only thing I want, refusing the idea of child support you didn't make him, and you didn't do this to him. As much as I hate her right now, I'm impressed that she seems to at least want to make amends for this. Maybe she just. Oh, uh, he's still faster. Cousin, Wait. But honestly, as long as I get to remain a dad, I might as well have. I'm dad. faster. In other related news. Yesterday or two days ago, whenever I posted. Give him the bird. I went to visit Sherry Max's soon-to-be ex, to see how she's holding up. When I arrived, Max's parents were there and were surprised to see me. I got a Interesting hug from my wife and she was crying and apologizing so much it almost made me cry. She was under the impression that I was never going to see my son again, which really upset her, because, and I didn't know this, but she used to love watching me play with my son at family gatherings. Basically, they are going to continue to allow Sherry and the baby to stay in their second home for as long as they like. Under the circumstances, Max will not be allowed there anymore and is basically disowned at this point. I'm not sure this was mentioned before, but the family seems to have gotten the idea that Max molested my wife and that this is some kind of abuse or Stockholm syndrome, and call me in a shoal but for the sake of my son's stability I will do nothing to correct them. If letting them believe this allows my wife to live at home with her folks and not having them fight over this in front of my boy then I will admit this. Sherry is a mess as one would expect. She has moments of being okay followed by tears, followed by anger. The more she talks about subjects not related to this the calmer she gets. Her family is going to be paying for her to see a therapist and her brother is coming to the state for a week to be with her and her mom is basically moving in with her for a month after that to try and help her cope. I got to feed her daughter today, such a cute kid and melted away my anxiety for a little while. Last night my friends and I went to the movies and I asked her if she'd like to- I'm sorry, I can't listen to the rest of this. That's just the fucked up situation altogether. That's what happens when you try to keep it in the family. Today we're going to be playing one of the hardest Pokemon games that just got updated. Everybody say hello to Pokemon Blaze Black 2 Redux. Somebody decided it was a good idea to go and take the Dreyano games and essentially modernize them and making them much harder by adding the fairy typing and a much harder AI. Pokemon have access to certain moves they didn't have in the original blaze black and white 2 and all sorts of crazy stuff obviously now obviously i can't showcase all the new additions in this game so with that being said we're going to be doing a actual nuzlocke series it's been a while so we may as well give it a blaze black right Shh. pokemon blaze black 2 
do, 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 do. You didn't see anything. You don't see anything. This shot, you know? Be sure to leave a like, a comment, and subscribe if you guys are new. We're almost at 200,000 subscribers. And if you enjoy the vibes, I would love if you came and be a part of the journey to 200,000 subscribers to be part of the family that's here. Also, all Pokemon will be named after Sacred Almighty paying subscribers. Over there, you get access to all Pokemon or all videos early. And if you... Uh... I don't remember this. I don't even know what the hell this is, but... Okay, what was that? No lie, dude. It's been a while since I've even touched these games, dude. I think the last time I played Blaze Black and Vol White 2, I think it was moon black 2 or something like that i think and i was gonna add like my own sprite but gen 5 rom hacking is just a different beast so shout outs to whoever created this game while also making it harder and adding everything else to it because dude i i can't be bothered man for real now how this whole nicknaming system thing works is the highest paying members get priority so they get their mons first and right now the starter and the highest paying member is rising volt so i gotta choose which one i want to go for first i think i might go with ted pig honestly maybe ted pig or snivy these two are really good for generation uh five no i just gotta pray that uh he's a really good typing please i'm begging you he is jolly see that's not too crazy but it's not take it i mean it's it's okay sheer I, yeah, force. Sheer force too thankfully i just don't have to use ember i know when i evolve i get all his fighting time moves so that's how that matters for real for me at least you know and you're out of here goodbye thank you no i'm saying let's go baby oh they give you 50 pokeballs off the rip hold on who are you who are you talking to do you know who i am i'm about to abuse those what i'm excited to see what my first pokemon is gonna be because i definitely don't I remember a little bit of the Dreano games, but not like the full thing. I could randomize like the wild encounters, but I think that would take away from like. I think that that's going to be another one that I'm uh, dip my toes into. Good job at making you feel. You're just not good to evolve, man. Never mind. They have a sun current. I could just, bro, you are it. Oh, hey, you know, it's time to get some things going on. I might, I might literally tweet at me. Then you're already like, I could have got a mod chop too. Wow, dude. All right, you know what to do. Move away, bro. I like how he just throws a random team at us <laughs> and just like leaves. Like that's going to distract us. Like, what are you doing, bro? Dude, I could have got a Riolu, man. Damn. All right, my egg's evolving. And my egg is going to be a please be something good. Please, I'm begging you. Please, I'm begging you, bro. I'm bet. Wait. It's a. Huh? What? This is going to be named after Drew. Here you go, Ma. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. What is. What is. What? You just gave me a. Why? But why, though? But why? Relaxed? Relaxed is decent, I guess, because it doesn't. I mean. Sure. All right, now it's time to just pretty much just sit here and uh, grind up, yeah? There's an item over here. You need that for sure. Whatever this is, it is a muscle band. Thank you. What? I didn't see that over there. What is this? Uh. All right. Okay, I'll just leave it alone. I thought these were going to be double battles, but I thought they, I don't know. I, something in my mind told me, hey, they changed it up, but I guess they didn't, huh? Never mind. Yeah, see, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so he's normal fairy, but fairy doesn't show up in here. Okay, that's weird. I wonder where the hell you get Trico from. Huh. Now, this was a lot harder. I'm yeah. definitely this going to look way harder. Up and see I if really, I don't have enough have mods already. to make up for it, though. I have five Pokemon. Wow. I just literally just got a random team out of nowhere, so that's kind of nuts. Wait, Coda's. Well. Why? <laughs> What's going on, everyone? Jeremy here from the court. I got a special. Easter what the fuck? <laughs> I 
Easter Sunday video for you. Why? Because, I don't know, maybe you're sitting around with family that, you know, you're like a C&E family person like I tend to be. A couple times a year is basically enough for me, at least for the extended family. Um, the more close family. I to go see awful, and but, think um, about Jesus. Certainly the Easter celebrations can tend to drag. And last night, Jack Dorsey gave us a bit of an Easter miracle. A little Easter basket of our own. Easter surprise. By essentially speaking out against his board of directors and uh, and appearing to, at least in my opinion, support Elon Musk in buying his company. This is a very bold statement to say publicly. I've archived it because I imagine he'll probably delete it. But before we get into all that <laughs> insanity, I've got a special Easter sponsor for you. Check this out. Huge shout out to this video's sponsor, Galaxy Lamps. Are you looking for a cool way to add some magic to your home? Well, look no further than the Galaxy Projector 2.0. This lamp projects vibrant RGB colors and laser stars, transforming any room into a magical planetarium. You can control the projector via the app, which gives you full control over the brightness, colors, rotation, speed, on-off, scheduling, and much more. So bring some magic into your home with the Galaxy Projector 2.0. The new Galaxy Projector 2.0 is the latest. That's actually pretty neat. I want a projector. Hey, sweets. Come here. Okay, you don't want to see this. See, look at what the projector did. Little tiny projector in the corner did all of this. You don't want that for your room? Or to make a room like pink and starry. I do. Then why are you acting like that? I thought you'd be like, hmm, that's nice. Or like, ooh. But you, you, there's no wow factor for you. You're like, hmm. It's okay. Because, oh, it's daddy. If your mama talked to you about it, you'd be like, ooh. That's what you get for lying. You're not lying. You know, I can tell you lying already. The greatest way to bring the beauty of the galaxy into your home. The stunning projection system creates a realistic planetarium yeah, right in that's your own why home. I was just telling you a look. Beautiful now. stars that you can control via the app. You can enjoy the night sky anytime, anywhere. Plus, Galaxy Lamps has an absolutely amazing Easter offer. So even if you're not ready right now, you could pick it up as a great gift for someone you know. It's 50% off, plus an extra $10 off for all orders over 50, an extra $25 off for all orders over 125, and an extra $50 off for all orders over $200. Use the link in the description below or pin comment to get your Galaxy Lamp and massive savings today. Now I thought that Elon and everyone else would kind of be quiet over the weekend, even though I was hoping we'd get some spicy stuff. And Elon's been pretty busy. It looks like he's agreed with a tweet saying the game is rigged if you can't buy Twitter. Many people are starting to hypothesize why Twitter doesn't want to be sold to Elon Musk. And it's starting to look more and more like there is some deeper reason here. It's because of such a valuable control tool, uh, a narrative controlling tool that the powers that be, whoever they may be, uh, don't want in private hands. That's what the, this is. That's what this is all about. You know, if I'm a shareholder, I think Goldman Sachs valued the stock at something like $30. So they're getting $54.20 over the $30 that Goldman Sachs says it's valued at. Yet yeah, Goldman Sachs also said that the offer of nearly double what the stock was worth wasn't enough. Why would Goldman Sachs be telling, saying, you know, the, the, against the buyout of Twitter, trying to control the narrative? It would be interesting to do It's dig more into. than enough. Musk's tumultuous bid to buy Twitter continued Saturday when Tesla CEO took to the social media platform to back claims that the game is rigged if he attempts to fail. 
If the game is fair, writes David Sachs, Elon will buy Twitter. If the game is rigged, there will be some reason he won't be able to. We're about to find out how deep the corruption goes. Elon simply replies, indeed. Of course, after giving an unsolicited $43 billion offer this week to buy Twitter after he claimed to have quietly become the largest shareholder, well, not anymore. Here's the thing about the unsolicited offer, right? I live in a neighborhood that's close to a, a, a kind of a highly sought after elementary school. Every single spring, there are people that send a letter mm. to everyone in our neighborhood. Realtors. Boring. Hey, is any like that can be big... that last broadcast could be summed up in like five minutes. Give me the clip notes version stories over the past two weeks has been the merger finally happening between <clears throat> Warner and Discovery. So a lot of people I don't like this Jim Gordon but he's a good actor so I'm a hold back on hold back on the knee jerk reaction too much and I heard that this was actually good but I'm not sure about how good like how deep into good are we are we like fucking awesome you should go see it and I'm buying the tickets no excuses or at your own leisure you know you should check it out people have been getting the axe a lot of people are going to still get the axe. There's a lot of layoffs coming, and there's going to be a lot of restructuring. More to come in time, I'm sure. One of the big questions that I've had out of this is what's going to happen to DC Comics because they're a mess. They've yep. been a mess for a long time, especially the comic book brand, which is in real trouble. If you ask me, like they really need to change a lot of the shit that they're doing because just look at Superman. They've changed Clark Kent, Cal Al Superman, to John Kent, and they've pretty much just done their best to make him the wokest character possible. Not just because he's got a K-pop boyfriend. It goes a lot further than that. Like The current storyline is him fighting fake news, which basically means anything outside of the mainstream narrative. Uh, Lex Luthor kind of coming off as some kind of Fox News Trump guy. Like, who wants to read this? Nobody wants to read this. Look at this. Like, like he's Trump at a podium. Basically turning Lex Luthor into Trump or something. I, I, I think this is ridiculous. So, basically, there's a fake mm. news campaign. Reading, or reading things, in my opinion, or consuming freaking media in any form, for that matter, shouldn't... Should be escapism, not. A podium. It's me, Knox, your favorite online personality. I'm back in a brand new, understated, yet relatable aesthetic. I unironically just want to have a chill time and hang out with you guys, my best friends. Would you like a hot take about a popular computer game? Elden Ring. It's just a little too extra. Yeah, I said it. Worst game I have ever played. With games like this, it's no wonder the West is in irreparable decline. I rate this game zero Will Smith slapping Chris Rock out of 10. But I'm willing to give it another shot. With a smaller nose and some shorter hair. Holy moly, I just made Frankie Muniz. <laughs> That's wild. 
it's an internet miracle. I actually really love Elden Ring now. I want to thank you for coming with me on this gaming journey. Let's celebrate together with this relevant product recommendation. Brand new from the conglomerate. The cube. <laughs> this exciting device meshes with my creative and productive lifestyle. The Cube is a multitasking six-screen device that fits perfectly in my hand. But if that's not enough to blow your mind, get a load of those tiny 6.25 millimeter bezels. Wow. Now available in Midnight Black, Charcoal Black, Bloodshit Brown, and Black. The Cube. Be yourself. Well, hasn't this been quite the adventure? If you too like Elden Ring, please make sure to smash that. <laughs> sometime. Make sure to subscribe and hit that bell. Thank you, my homies. Hmm. Why are you doing this? You gonna let me talk or you just wanna interrupt me the entire time, ma'am? Do you wanna let me talk or not? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the Lackluster Channel. Today's story was submitted by Brittany, who on the 10th of May in 2019 was traveling eastbound with her husband Charles on Malvern Road in Garland, Arkansas. The vehicle in front of them was an Arkansas State Police cruiser being driven by Trooper Ryan Wingo. The crash report narrative alleges that Trooper Wingo observed a vehicle traveling above the posted speed limit heading westbound, and the trooper did a U-turn to conduct a traffic stop. What the narrative fails to include is that Trooper Wingo had not turned on his lights and sirens and made the U-turn from the left lane, instead of moving the cruiser out of traffic and performing the U-turn from the center left turn lane. The trooper's illegal maneuver caused multiple vehicles to slow down, including Charles and Brittany. Charles honked at the trooper, causing Wingo to abandon his pursuit of the speeding vehicle. Now, with his emergency lights and tones activated, the trooper made a second U-turn to chase down Charles and Brittany for honking at him. Observing the trooper returning to them, Charles and a passenger van behind him pulled to the right and slowed down, as is required by law when an emergency vehicle approaches from the rear. Trooper Wingo sped towards their vehicle, but failed to stop in time, locked up his brakes, and crashed into the rear of Charles and Brittany. Wow! They all pulled into a nearby lot, and Trooper Wingo approaches, demanding the IDs of both Charlie and Brittany. They initially argue over identifying Brittany, as she is the passenger, and at this point is only the victim to Trooper Wingo's recklessness. Charles then argues that he would rather give his information to the trooper's supervisor, who would have been dispatched to an officer-involved accident. The argument escalated, and Wow. That's unbelievable. choice words were exchanged between the two, and instead of waiting for his supervisor to come investigate the accident he just caused, Trooper Wingo opens the car door and pulls Charles out. It is at this point that Brittany starts recording.
There was no need for cussing me out. Until he can calm down and act like an adult, <laughs> let me send back the car. Let me explain to you. My husband we, has severe PTSD. Severe. <laughs> severe. He's a hundred percent disabled veteran. And he's he, that's why I'm here. You gonna, you gonna talk to me? You gonna let me talk or you just wanna interrupt me the entire time? Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. Until he can calm down and act like a human being and stop cussing me out for no reason. You just hit the, the back of his car! But he doesn't wanna let me talk, okay? <laughs> So do you want to let me talk or not? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Now. Meow. Brittany ended the video to call her father, and so far, no dash cam or body cam has been released. A few minutes after Charles was cuffed and stuffed for honking and arguing with the man that crashed into his vehicle, a supervising officer arrives on scene and releases him. However, he was issued citations for following too closely and stopping on a highway. Even though Trooper Winko was initiating a traffic stop on his vehicle and was using his emergency lights as he approached, the narrative also claims the vehicle was in transport, not parked, further opposing the citation for stopping on a highway. If what Brittany alleges is true, it sounds as if Trooper Wingo was unable to control his adrenaline and ego when in the performance of his duties, conducted several illegal maneuvers on the highway, creating dangerous conditions for multiple other drivers, and caused an accident. Afterwards, he used the power of the state to retaliate against Charles, all for honking at a bad driver. Charles is a disabled veteran and suffers from PTSD, and this incident has further compounded his issues and distrust in authority. At the time, Charles and Brittany decided it was better for his mental health to pay the fines and move on. But in the light of the multitude of recent exposures of corrupt law enforcement officers and agencies, they've decided to tell their story and pursue civil action. I want to reiterate that all of this but the video is alleged, but it is mostly supported by the crash report that was filled out by a trooper that wasn't on scene and didn't witness anything. The report fails to mention the argument or detention of Charles and reports that the trooper was never tested for driving under the influence, as is standard operating procedure for nearly all departments in the U.S. Below, I will link Brittany's original- That is fucked up. That is just fucked up. If you do something, if you do something and have a crash and a trooper or any other type of law enforcement police officer comes in, and freaking, oh, man, you're in exchanging information? All right, good, good. You off the side of the road? Good, good. Oh, you're having some trouble? I'll freaking help out right away. You're detained, you're detained, you're detained. Nah, man, fuck that. They don't freaking, they don't, mm -hmm. Mm. Jesus. I know it's not all police officers, but how many good ones out there actually promote doing the right thing? Original videos where she explains more of the story. And how many good ones sit around and do nothing while the bad ones have their way? in her own words. As always, let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks for watching. If you have a video you'd like me to review, email it or send it in via Facebook Messenger. You can also view this and other content on my website. Hey everyone, this is Manly Badass Hero and welcome to Remember Places. Okay, power's back. Well, old school monitor. Welcome back. Well, as per usual, I'm obligated to remind you that I'm your only friend. Truth. Looking for any outside will only result in disease and sadness. Do not leave. This is truly a beautiful sight. Uh, what year and month was this made? You used to gather in large columns like these. Not me. I hope you are feeling wonderfully nostalgic. Like you are really here. I'd love to talk more, but you're running low on coins. Oh my god, my AI friend's a gacha machine. Please understand, it's the only way we can keep the servers up. 
I also have to remind you that every coin picked up will automatically deduct 2 USD from your social account. Damn. I love you. Well, I mean, you love me. I am a, um... Apparently I'm addicted to this. Oh my god, how much have I spent? Six dollar dues? Even more. Well... So I'll be. Nice job, friend. I could probably stay here forever. As long as you pay, apparently. It's like a fireworks show looking at all these lit up windows. I know life in one place can get boring after a while, though. Hopefully I can continue to keep it interesting for you. I want you to feel like you're outside. I mean, if outside was a PS1 game, with me. <laughs> Smiley face. AI sent me a... Okay, he plays like creepypasta games, mostly. My fiance, female 23, deceived me, male 26, for three months by claiming she wanted to rebuild our broken relationship. After that, she had an affair with a co-worker. It's always the co-worker. On the 22nd of August this year, we announced our engagement to one another. What's up everyone, my name is Alpha and today we're back with Bad enough a bad special news. video we're on Pokemon Omega Ruby and this week's shiny video will be Can I be Pokemon Omega Ruby Hardcore Nuzlocke with only shiny dark type Pokemon? Now we're trying out something new uh, with the thumbnails. If you guys do like the thumbnails, let me know in the comments because uh, we're just trying something new. Hopefully we get some new viewers and hopefully we grow our audience because I know a lot of you guys do enjoy the series. Now if you guys do not know what a Hardcore Nuzlocke shiny only challenge is, we're going to run down the rules real quick. So firstly, a Nuzlocke being, you're only able to catch the first Pokemon in each route and only a first encounter. I think I just said that twice. But in our situation, it's going to be the dark type, typing Pokemons only per each route. So if there's a route with multiple dark type Pokemon, the first one you find that's shiny is the only one you can catch. It's very niche, but there are routes that have multiple shiny dark type Pokemon that you kind of want to prioritize more than the others. And as well, continuing from the Nuzlocke. If your Pokemon ever faints at all, that means your Pokemon is dead and gone. You cannot use that Pokemon ever again. So that's why there's a death counter on the bottom left. Helps you keep track along with me. And also adding some harder rules on it. That's why it's called Hardcore. These Hardcore rules include playing on set mode. So that means when you beat an opponent's Pokemon, another trainer's Pokemon, you cannot switch out automatically during the dead turn. You have to do it on your turn manually. It's a hard switch like in Wi-Fi battles. And also, you cannot use items inside a battle. You can use hell items. You know, you can go into battle with your Pokemon holding items, but you cannot use bag items in the battle, such as potions. And finally, for the hardcore rules, and there is a level cap for each gym of the game. The level cap will be based on the ace Pokemon of the gym leaders, so the highest level in the gym. You cannot be past that level when you enter the gym fight, but you can gain a level in the gym battle, and it still be passable. So that's basically all the rules you need to know. So the last and most important role, the final role of this challenge, each of my Pokemon will be nicknamed after you guys in the comments. So thanks so much for leaving a comment in the previous catchable Poochiana at the start of the game where you get your starter. So a lot of people do not like shiny Poochianas for that reason. But that is going to be our starter Pokemon for that. And as well, we're going to have to train it up. Since it's level 2, we're going to have to train up and it's not too easy training up. But luckily enough, we're going to get to level 5 at least and then head into route 103 now there is another pokemon for us to catch we're able to catch ourselves a c dot in here uh it's gonna spend a little time because c dot is a five percent encounter i believe so it's very difficult to find but once we end up finding a shiny c dot uh it's not a dark type itself but it does evolve to a dark type so it does qualify we just can't use it until it becomes a dark type once we capture the c dot we can use it but once we head into a pedal Big woods and we end up being this team magma grunts we're able to get the XP share from the scientists, which will actually help us get our C dot level up without even using them in battle. Once we train up our Poochiana and our C dot side by side, we're able to evolve our C dot into a Nuzleaf. Now, Nuzleaf is a dark and grass type Pokemon, which is very, very useful because we're gonna head into the first gym of the game and we're gonna face off against Roxanne. Roxanne? <laughs> Roxanne. <laughs> Roxanne is gonna be the first gym leader in the game. And she's also going to be the rock type gym leader. So we're going to start this battle off against her using our Nuzleaf. 
which has Razor Leaf, which is four times super effective to the Geodude. Of course, that's easily going to bring down the Geodude, and we should not have a hard time. Use a potion up. doesn't matter. We're going to two-shot the Geodude because that's sturdy. And then the Nose Pass comes out next. It does not do enough damage with Rock Tomb. I can live another one. Uh, Lucky enough, I do live a Tackle, too. So I'm able to Razor Leaf it down, two-shot down Roxanne's entire team, and we get the first Gym Badge. Fairly easily. I thought she had was. like uh, Onyx. Now, Nuzzy is going to play a big part in the second gym as well. As we head into the second gym on Dooford Island and face off against Brawly. Now, Brawly is going to be the fighting type gym leader, which is going to be very difficult since we have dark type Pokemon. We're going to start off the battle off against him using our Nuzzy to raise Leaf into his Machop. It's going to two shot him. Unfortunately, the Karate Chop two shots me, so I have to be very careful here. And luckily enough, I get the big roll to knock out the Machop. In the second turn, and Makuhita just lets me knock him out. Says, focus up, and then I knock him out. So, we end up beating Brawly down fairly easily. Uh, next up, we're going into Slateport City to get some incense. I also want to explain that we're playing on Omega Ruby because we wanted to play with Nuzly. There are two Dark-type Pokemon that are version exclusive. One is in Alpha Sapphire, which is a Sableye. One is in... <laughs> Omega Ruby, which is a Nuzleaf. I have to choose between one or the other. I chose Nuzleaf because I feel like Shift Tree might be more useful since there's more water Pokemon and water trainers. So unfortunately, I cannot use the Sableye. Might have been useful, but there's not a lot of dark type Pokemon and they made me pick between them two. I could have spawned them in, but I decided not to. From there, we're going to evolve our gold Poochiana into a Mightyana. It's going to be very useful as we also go out and sell all our items to get at least $10,000 to buy ourselves the Power Up Punch TM at the Pokemon in Marlboro City and also go into Verdant Turf Town, go into the tunnels and then find ourselves Black Glasses, which is a hell item that boosts up dark time moves, which is going to be very useful for us. As we head into the next gym of the game, we're going to face off against Watson in his electric gym in Marlboro City. We're going to start the battle off against Watson, obviously using our Nuzly. We taught Nuzly Power Punch, so it should be pretty good against him. So we're going to start out a battle power punching. We also have a cherry berry. We do not have a cherry berry. Why? Why well, don't I have a cherry berry on my Nuzleaf? This could have been so much easier if it didn't. Well, I'm risking it. So I forgot to put a cherry berry on my Nuzleaf, but I'm able to power punch into the Magneton. And I get two plus attacks. He's getting supersonic me. I power punch. I break through it. And I'm able to knock out the Magneton. So the biggest threat is gone at least. Um, Magnemite comes out next. It's going to, well, hit me and I knock myself in confusion. So I can't risk it. I decided to go out to my Mighty Anna. Luckily, Mighty Anna has the black glasses on. So it's able to survive Volt Switches and also Bite would do a lot of damage. So we're able to knock out the Magnemite and the Voltor fairly easily with Bite. And it doesn't get crunched into like the end game. So yeah, Mighty Anna is not going to be good for a long time. Nothing too much to do as we head into the next gym. We head into Lava Rich Town and face off against the next gym leader. We're going to face off against Flannery. This battle, it was kind of scary in my head because I don't know what to really do against her. So we're going to start a battle off against her using my Mighty Anna to howl in front of the Slugma. Luckily, it does not overheat on first turn. I'm able to bite it. One shot to knock him out. Torka comes out. I know I can survive an overheat and I decided to bite it first and then it went for a sunny day. I'm not going to risk it. I'm going for a dig. It did not go for an overheat on the second turn. And it went for a curse this turn. That's not good because overheat would definitely kill me at this range. Luckily, I end up critting him with a dig. And I'm able to survive this battle. Because Numa comes out, I'm always going to knock it out with a dig. Things are very easy for us. But that crit matters so much. I thought I was going to go for overheat. I think I would have been able to one-shot it if it didn't curse up. But it cursed up at the wrong time. But from there though, since we beat Flannery, we have access into the desert with our Go-Go glasses. I think it's Go-Go goggles, but Go-Go glasses, same thing. I don't want a shiny hunt for a Cacnea just right now because it is very annoying to be in the desert and have no escape because I don't have a flying type Pokemon justified being here. I decided to leave because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have fun shiny hunting for this because Trapping's gonna arena trap me. It's gonna be very annoying. So I decided to leave and come back later at that point i decided to go into the next gym of the game we're gonna face off against norman norman is going to be the norm type gym leader in the game and we're gonna start our battle off against him using my mighty anna now mighty anna is going to intimidate down the slack king to lower his attack step by one stage you can lower his stat six stages down and six stages up so we're gonna go back and forth until he obviously has no attack stat left which is kind of funny now this is crucial to do because slack king is a very strong pokemon and we also have power punch as a move on my nuzleaf 
So we're gonna start power up punching into the Slack King to get our attack boost up. Eventually, I am able to knock out the Slack King, taking about 30 damage from him from Retaliate. I'm also able to one shot down the Vigor off as he encores me into the attack I want to do, anyways. And then his next Slack King comes out next. I decide to go out to my Mighty Anna to intimidate him down and survive, luckily, survive. Uh, retaliate and then i'm able to dig and keep digging and avoiding all his moves because he has true and obviously dig is a great move to have and we end up beating down the slacking since we already use up his hyper potion and we end up beating norman with our mighty anna and we have secure the fifth gym badge since we have access to surf now we also have access into the good rod we get the good rod on this route now we can search out for two new pokemon there's two pokemon that we end up getting just from fishing they're barely low spawn though they're like five percent and like ten percent so first one is a 5% encounter of Corefish. We're going to spend a little time fishing out in Route 117 for a Shiny Corefish. We get a bunch of Magikarp. We also get a bunch of Shiny Magikarps. I got bored, so I went on my Surfing Pokemon. But I am able to find ourselves a Shiny Corefish, and that will be our next team member. Next up, we're going to go out into this water right outside of where we got the Good Rod. And we're able to find ourselves a Shiny Carvana, which was actually easier than the Corefish. Corefish took way longer. Now that we got both Pokemon on our team, we can train them up, and which is great news for us because Corefish actually evolves to a Crawdon, and it's a Water-type Pokemon. Well, both are Water-type Pokemon, but they have access to Water-type moves, which can beat down camera ups, which are very prevalent in Team Magma people's teams. So that's actually pretty good for us. And now we're going to head into the next gym of the game. We're going to head into Winona's gym, the Flying-type gym of the game. We're going to start the battle off against her using our Sharpedo. Surprisingly enough, Sharpedo has Ice Fang as a move before it has a water move. Ice Fang into the Swallow and one-shotting it. She then is going to switch out to her Altaria, which is a Dragon and Flying type. So I'm going to Ice Fang it, one-shot it, which I, I feel like that was poorly planned by her. I'm not going to lie. And then she's going to switch out into her Pelipper, which at this point, I'm going to go out into my Mighty Anna. We can, oh, he has no attack. He has no physical attack at all. So I'm going to three-shot him using Bite, and that should be the end of that. Super simple. Next up, she can switch out to her Skarmory, her last Pokemon in the game. I decided to stay in, just bite it down, because I have Black Glasses on my Mighty Anna. It should do a lot of damage. I end up knocking him out, and that is the end of that. We get our... Oh, it got very close there. Ah, uh, I risked it. But we end up getting our sixth gym badge of the game without losing a single Pokemon once again. It's looking like another Deathless run. Will we get another Deathless run? Leave it in the comments before you see the end of this video. Now after that, we're going to head into the route right next to Fortree City. In this grass, you could find ourselves an Absol. Absol, one of the best looking shinies, one of the best looking Pokemon. Unfortunately, it's kind of mid-tier mid as a Pokemon, but it's actually pretty cool as a Pokemon. And it's actually pretty easy to find in this grass. So we're able to find ourselves a... Absol just needs faster... Uh, a faster base speed in order to be competitive. It has everything else shiny red Absol, very cool very nice and obviously put that on a team it got to our last pokeball we do this a lot where we risk it and we only have one pokeball left but we're able to catch ourselves a shiny Absol, and we can move on into the next area of the game which is going to be mount pyre i only show this because there are a few items in here we get a c incense in here we get a lax incense and the tm for shadow ball which i don't think we use at all because all my pokemon are physical attackers but you know it's nice to have i guess and then from there, this battle with May very quickly could have been really bad. It could have went into a whole different direction. This battle is looking pretty grim. I mean, my Sharpedo it needs to it needs to survive against the Waylord. Luckily, and Sharpedo is not known for his defense. Luckily, I'm able to beat down the Waylord and we can move on back into the desert. Actually, the desert. Well, firstly we get some Pokeballs because we ran out of Pokeballs. But firstly, we're gonna go into the desert and hunt for a shiny Cacnea. Because Cacnea is going to be the last shiny Pokemon we hunt for. It's not going to be a dark type initially until we evolve it into a Cacturn. So finally, we're gonna be able to find ourselves a red looking Cacnea. It's fairly easy to find. And then we head into the 7th gym batch of the game. We're going to face off against Tate and Liza in Moss Deep City. They're going to be a double battle fight and they only have two Pokemon. Not two Pokemon each. They have two Pokemon. One each. One Pokemon each. Which Luntone and Sorok. It shouldn't be too difficult. I say this, but I did lose a Mega Heracross like two months ago against this two. But I, in this situation, we're able to bite into the Soul Rock and knock him out. And also Crab Hammer into the Lunatone to knock him out. And the gym is, gym battle's over. Well, well played. GG well played to Tate and Liza. It actually took longer to learn Crunch on one of my Pokemon than fighting them. So <laughs> that was fun. Next up, we're going to face off against Maxi. 
Maxi, this is the final Team Magma fight. Normally, I don't show this, but this fight, this fight does get very dicey, as you see. My Pokemon get down to low, low HP, and I feel like someone was going to die at this point. I didn't know how. Unfortunately, I missed two Crab Hammers, very crucial Crab Hammers. One on Crobat and one on the Camera Up. The Camera Up, if it attacked, it would have been over. It would have been ropes for me. It yawned me. I stayed in Razor Shell, knocks out the Camera Up. I said Crab Hammer, but I meant Razor Shell, but... That would have been very close. I would have broke something. But we beat Maxi and we can move on into the Primal Groudon fight. This is going to be the last mini boss, main boss of the game type thing. It's not going to be a gym leader, but it is very scary. So we start off the battle off against him using our Mightyana to lower his attack stat because his Earthquake, Precipice Blades, very strong move. I barely survived one against him. I'm looking for a defense drop. I feel like I need to switch out because I need to survive an Earthquake. I need to get another attack drop. I risk my uh, Shift Tree here. Because I, I, I had to risk it. I need to do some damage. I went for a faint attack. So maybe it was poorly planned. I went back out into my Mighty Anna to intimidate him down once again. But he's going to Lava Plume and knock out my Mighty Anna. So down goes my starter Pokemon, which is unfortunate. I go out to my Sharpedo. It's the only thing on my team that can learn Earthquake. And I just realized my team looks like Sydney's team from the Elite Four. But anyways, I'm able to three shot the Groudon using my Sharpedo. I've been trying to bait in, trying to make him use rest the whole time. Because... My Sharpedo obviously has Earthquake, so I'm trying to bait in that. But unfortunately, Mighty Anna goes down, and we end up losing one Pokemon already. So this is not going to be a deathless run at all. But we're going to move on and face off against Wallace next. Wallace is going to be the Water-type Gym Leader and the final Gym Leader in the game. We're going to face off against Wallace, starting off with our Cacturn first. You assume Cacturn was going to be very good. He gets confused right off the start, hits himself, gets beat down by Draining Kiss, gets beat down by the Love This. Finally, Needle Arms punch him in the face and beat him. Unfortunately, Malachi comes out next, and it does have Ice Beam, I assume. So I went out into my Crawdon next. It's going to get Ice Beam, and it's going to crunch him, get a Hydro Pump. I'm going to die to another Hydro Pump, I assume. But I'm able to crunch him and force him into this place where he needs to recover constantly. I lower his defense, and it keeps needing to recover. At this point, it's lost. I'm about to one-shot him and knock him out. See? So I decided to go for a Hydro Pump as a last-ditch effort. I survived one. And I knocked out the Malatic, and it should be ropes for him. Because I could go out to my Shift Tree next. And Shift Tree can just one shot everything. Leaf Blade into the Wish Cache to knock him out, obviously. Leaf Blade into the Celio to knock him out. And Leaf Blade into the Seeking to knock him out. And we end up beating Wallace fairly nice. easily. We only have one death on our team. Well, there's only six Dark type Pokemon we can even get. But we have one death on our team. We can go into Victory Road and clear through Victory Road. Uh, trying to avoid some battles because I really don't want to lose my Pokemon. So I'm trying to avoid as many battles as I can and then train up against the wild Pokemon later on. Once we clear through Victory Road, we're going to head into the Pokemon League and face off against the Elite Four itself. Now, the Elite Four is actually not too difficult. We're going to first start off our Elite Four challenge against Sydney. Sydney is going to be the Dark type user of the Elite Four and it's basically the same as us. We're going to start the battle off against him using our Shift Tree. We're going to Power Up Punch into his Mightyena. We avoid his takedown, so we're just going to Break Break, knock out his Mightyena, just take it. Break Break into his Absol, almost knocks him out. But, and he's going to aerialize me, but I'm able to power up punch once again and outspeed him, knock him out fairly easily. Down goes his Absol. His Sharpedo comes on next. It's not going to outspeed me. Leaf Blade will knock him out. And his next two Pokemon will be a Cacturn and also a Shift Tree, which also goes down to a Brick Break. And we end up beating Sydney very easily. Never had a problem with him at all. Next up, we're going to move on into the Ghost type of Leaf Four member. We're going to face off against Phoebe. Now, Phoebe is actually not that great of a Elite Four member against us because we're dark type users and we're going to start the battle off against her using our Absol. Absol is going to be a really good sweeper. We're in a Void Sword Dance right now because it has Will O Wisp and all that and Curse and all that nonsense. So we're in Night Slash into him to knock him out in one shot. And the Sableye comes out next. This is my chance to set up because I don't think it can do any damage. Power Gems me, but Night Slash will end up knocking him out. Next Pokemon will be a Dusnor. I'm just going to Night Slash into him. My most powerful move. I also have the Black Glasses on since my Mighty Anna went down. And it'll finish off the entirety of her team. As I'm going to Night Slash her last Bayonet and end up beating Phoebe without losing a single Pokemon. Now next up, we're going to face off against Glacia. Glacia is going to be the Ice type Elite Four member. Now I try to be Entertainer. I try to be YouTuber. And I try to use a variety of my Pokemon. So I started my rattle using my Absol and Sword Sense in front of him. So I'm going to Night Slash knock out the Glalie first. And then, obviously, mess up against this stupid Frost Slash. Uh, I get confused, right? I I thought it was going to go for Blizzard. I thought it was going to be something smart. I, if I went for a Night Slash there, it would have been over for it. So, now my Absol is out of commission. I go into my Sharpedo. 
and I decided to crunch him. Ends up knocking him out with a crit, which is great. He goes out into his next Frostless. I go out for another crunch. It misses, but luckily enough, I outspeed him and I could crunch him again. So it worked out for the best. Next up, she can switch out to her wall ring. I'm like, I have no switch ins. I decided to go my cac turn. Okay, first mistake. I get hit by a blizzard. Why would you blizzard a water type Pokemon? Why wouldn't you? I feel like you could have done any other damage. It's stuck using blizzard, which is fine. As I sword stands up with my card on, brick break him, and knock him out. And then it goes out into its Glalie. I'm like, I'm faster than it. It's not. I'm not faster than Glalie somehow. Base 60 speed Glalie outspeeds my three level higher Crawdons and freeze dry me. So now I'm left to three Pokemon and I'm able to knock out the final Glalie, obviously. And we beat Glacia, which is unfortunate because I feel like I shouldn't lose two Pokemon there. One of my water type and my grass type, which Cacturn, I'm not too mad about losing, but Crawdon, I needed him to win the game. So I'm struggling here. I don't have an idea of how to beat the next two. I'm relying on Absol now. So next up, we're going to face up against Drake. Drake is going to be the Dragon type Elite Four member. We're going to hopefully try to beat him down quickly with our Absol. We're going to start the battle off against him using our Absol to set up what a sword stands. Hit, get hit with a Moonblast because obviously Altaria has that. So I'm going to knock him out using a Night Slash, knock out the Flygon using a Night Slash, and then knock out the next Flygon using a Night Slash. His next Pokemon is going to be a Salamence. I don't have a switch into this. I decided to go for a Night Slash. He's going to outspeed me. I should have went for a Sucker Punch. I thought I could outspeed him, but I can outspeed him using my Sharpedo and Ice Fangum to knock him out, which is great. And then he's going to switch out to his final Pokemon, which is going to be a Kingdra. I mean, it shouldn't be too difficult. I two-shot him. He yawns me. I mean, not an issue at all. Issue is, I got to beat Steven Stone using two Pokemon now. I did come up with a strategy to beat Steven Stone with Sharpedo and Ship Tree. So we have to be oh, perfect hi. with this. So we started the battle off against Steven Stone with our Sharpedo. We're going to try to freeze it. Did not work. And then I got toxic. I was like, this is over. I lost. Well, at least I can still post the video. I go for some flinches with Waterfall. I go back for some freezes. And he has all his hazards up. I decided to go out with a Waterfall to knock him out at least. I'm down to low HP. Waterfall actually ends up knocking down a uh, model, which is nice. I go down to lower HP. Ice Fang into the Cradley. Does not freeze him either, and I'm left with my Shift Tree. I decided to go for a Power Punch against him. He's going to hit me with a Confuse Ray, which I'm like, okay. Brick Break can kill him. Okay, Brick Break knocks out the Cradley. That's good for us. I'm going to Power Punch into the Aggron. Hopefully, it misses his move. It did not miss at all. And then I'm like, hopefully, I don't hit myself. I don't hit myself. I Power Punch. Okay, all I got to do is keep setting up, I think. If I just had Roost, I thought Shift Tree can learn Roost, but I get I keep setting up against uh, the Clay Doll because I need to one shot down the Metagross. Now I think the Metagross also has Power Punch, so that's not a good thing. I end up brick breaking, breaking out of its Reflect and its Light Screen, so I can you know obviously survive it. And then Leaf Blade to end up knocking out the Clay Doll, and Metagross comes out. If it bullet punches me, I'm dead. It ends up not bullet punching me. I outspeed him, Faint Attack, one shots him because I'm obviously plus six. And I end up beating Steven Stone, even though everything went wrong. I was just trying to do anything. My whole plan was to set up with Shift Tree, get set up, plus six, and then sweep everything. But everything went wrong. I couldn't get a freeze on a Skarmory. I couldn't get anything on it. My, Unfortunately, my Sharpedo got toxic. And then I was running out of HP because, you know, I'm in bullet punch range the whole time from the Metagross. Because it's Tough Claws. It's a Metagross. It's a Mega Metagross. And I somehow survived that. He actually threw the entire game. And we end up beating Steven Stone. And that, honestly, was my favorite run. I cannot believe we clutched up. Sharpedo still on the screen, but that is five deaths. Our last survivor was that 5% C dot we caught at the very beginning of the game. That's actually a perfect ending. I hope you guys all enjoyed this video. If you guys can, please support the video by leaving a like yeah, and subscribing sorry. to the channel. And drop. Jesus Christ, oh my what God. is that? What is that? I don't know. Alex. Alex, what? Grab it. Grab it. I'm not gonna grab that. You grab it. Get in the car, Get in the car, Morty! Get in the car! <laughs> Come on, Zach. Let's go to heaven. Sit, wait. Sit, wait, 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 w
from original sketches and parodies to bite-sized memes and storytime animations. Animators have found a way to make a name for themselves online throughout the years. While it is not as lucrative or easy as other forms of online content creation, this hasn't stopped passionate voices from making their own cartoons. And whether you stumble upon these videos through YouTube recommendations or by going on Newgrounds, there are gems to be found here. A traitor! <laughs> well, let's just send Gladius a message. If we can't go to them, maybe them can go to we. <laughs> I knew you were going to do this from the moment I got out of bed today. That's <laughs> awesome. I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, you would pull some horse piss like this. God oh, damn it. I'll crap, get crap, you crap, for crap, this, crap. Steve. Oh Big top God. burger. Yet, as much as we adore the independence of these cartoons, I think we've all collectively thought that it would be pretty neat if we saw any of these guys on TV to see what their voice would be like if they had a crew and studio money. But despite the amount of talent that has appeared throughout the years, for the longest time nothing has really crossed that threshold. Instead, established names just find success elsewhere. A web series will gain its following, be it a couple of episodes or longer, until the creators move on to something else. Hopefully with some success. If a channel is big enough, they'll launch a Kickstarter and have their fans fund their projects themselves. But having a fan base doesn't guarantee success. Sometimes somebody with sizable support will announce a project, only for it to quietly fade away from public conversation while, optimistically, the project sits in production hell. Getting something started is hard, you know, let alone getting a studio to pick you up. If an 8 million sub channel has trouble getting picked up, what more for independent artists with smaller followings? It just seemed impossible. But fast forward to now, and the landscape is starting to shift. Michael Cusack's YOLO has turned into a series. Has-Been Hotel has been picked up by A24 Studios, and now Smiling Friends is officially on HBO Max. That's a big deal, especially when the content transcends the stigma of being made by a YouTuber. You know, the type of content that only seems to entertain existing fans. Prov because YouTubers are now saturating the market. in transferring from one media to another. Providing nothing of substance to newcomers as they look dumbfounded as to how these folks gained a following in the first place. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. Joe Penna, aka Mystery Guitar Man, went from nifty music videos to making Hollywood movies. George Miller went from being filthy and pink to being showered in pop star success. And Bo Burnham went from an anxious self-loathing teen in his room to anxious self-loathing man in his room for Netflix. And now, Zach joins Michael on this list of people who've made it without the YouTuber stigma. And they've managed to avoid this stigma by creating something familiar without being derivative of their past work. Longtime fans will enjoy the familiar humor, whilst people who aren't in the know will probably enjoy what the show is offering. And the show has a lot to offer. Ow. Hey, no biting. Hey, no biting. Okay? You want me to bite you? Yeah. You know that hurts, Daddy. I told you, silly. No biting, okay? You're my good little baby, huh? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Sitting on a rock. <laughs> so, yeah, I think this is pretty funny. To me, at least. And the reason why is because of how the show takes advantage of the animation medium. From the goofy two frame loops to the buttery smooth moments, the show proves its comedic competence through its visual variety. Crude drawings are funny looking without being off-putting, whilst crudeness is never a substitute for quality. Because if the show decides to flex, it can totally show off some well-animated stuff. 
Competence and crudeness is done with intent, and it's a matter of knowing when and where you place these moments throughout each episode. And with something like the silly Halloween special, where the show manages to flip between comedy and tension rapidly without ever feeling jarring, I can't help but applaud the show from a technical standpoint. You're gonna die in him. And if you put this on paper, jump roping between the mundane and the fantastical with the occasional scream tossed in, it sounds awful. In the wrong hands, this would be some lol random humor that would be on some kid's YouTube channel. But if you're familiar with the duo's individual work, this is what they're known for, <laughs> and they've been doing this for years. Alright, I'm not going to watch the whole thing, but I am going to have to watch it later. We're... So back in January, I got this weird idea to create my very own cinematic universe using abandoned superheroes straight out of the public domain. Characters with backstories and abilities so absurd and unpopular that they were thrown away almost immediately after they were originally published. And for better or worse, this concept has stuck with me, and evidently with many of you too. My inbox is full of fan art, storyline pitches, resumes, all of whom want a taste of bargain bin cinematic action. And while I half-jokingly suggested that I had begun writing scripts for some of these hypothetical movies, I found myself, like, oddly motivated after getting so much positive feedback. So, even though it started as a complete joke, over the past three months, I wrote an entire movie for the first superhero. <laughs> Why do I do this? Today I'm sharing with you the story of Atlas, the history of the superhero and what I think a modern adaptation might look like. No. So to begin, you should know that the Man of Might appeared in an obscure comic book called Daring Adventures, owned by the company IW Publications, aka Super Comics, one of the many short-lived companies capitalizing on the back end of the Golden Age. There's a bit of history. In the mid-1950s, the United States Senate formed a subcommittee to investigate the growing problem of juvenile delinquency in America, and the comic book business found itself caught in the crosshairs. Completely upended by this shift in public perception and fearing the possibility of government regulation, many comic book publishers simply chose to close up shop. They sold off their properties and inventory and began pursuing other genres and mediums. By the end of the 50s, starting a new comic book company seemed like one of the worst business decisions imaginable. Nobody was buying, and even if they did, the newly implemented censorship of the Comics Code Authority ensured that any stories being told were watered down and uninspired. But a businessman named Israel Waldman saw things differently. Sensing a hole in the market, he launched IW Publications, a super low-budget comic book company that would sell primarily in grocery stores, usually in packs three issues for a quarter. Waldman's strategy was simple, flood discount stores with tons of different comics from every genre imaginable, sell all of them for super cheap, and within a few years become the biggest name in the business. And from 1958 to 1964, IW Publications had around 115 different titles, each with their own collections of stories and characters. How was he able to amass such an incredible volume of content in such a short amount of time? He stole it! While planning out his business, Walden discovered that all those comic book companies that had closed their doors over the previous years, they sold their printing plates to random companies at rock bottom prices just to get rid of excess equipment. Walden meticulously tracked these abandoned printing plates down, bought them from scrap markets and aftermarket options for super cheap, and just fired them back up and began printing those comics again under his own company's label. 
Sometimes he'd make sure to acquire the actual intellectual property rights for these stories. But a lot of times he totally didn't and just sold those stories anyway, occasionally just designing new cover art or giving the characters in the stories different names. Using this borderline, if not totally illegal strategy, Walden's team had a huge selection of titles to sell, but they did lots of other tricks too. They would purposely misnumber certain issues to make particular catalogs seem more reputable. They would hire up-and-coming artists and illustrators who worked for cheap to create more original publications that they would then sandwich stolen titles between. Because he refused to spend a lot of money on upfront costs, most of these original comics were usually super low quality. The characters were often uninspired or straight-up propaganda, but over time the remaining comic readership in America started to see through these gimmicks and IW comics became synonymous with poor quality ripoffs. And all that brings us back to Daring Adventures, one of IW's many attempts at the horror suspense genre. It began with issue number nine and ran for eight issues until the company's final days in 1964. The last installment was Daring Adventures 18. On the cover is Our Man Atlas. Two interesting things here. Number one, the origin story on the cover doesn't match the plot of the actual comic at all. And number two, Atlas is not a horror suspense story. It's an action adventure. All this lends credence to the possibility that the company knew that they were nearing the end and they just kind of threw together whatever leftover comics they had in the bin to make one last print run for their final issues. Atlas tells the story of Jim Randall, a wimpy and down-on-his-luck office clerk who has eyes for a lady named Linda Thompson, who has just started working down the office hall as a stenographer. Jim shoots his shot and offers to walk Linda home one night, and to his surprise, she agrees. Outside Linda's place, the pair run into her younger brother, Andy, who is caught in a fight with another kid named Pug. Pug and his crew are working with Duke Cazzini, a local mobster. Linda steps up to defend her little brother, and Duke begins taunting her. Eventually, Jim finally decides to intervene and immediately finds himself punched in the face. Duke pieces out and Linda pulls Jim and Andy inside. Utterly humiliated and nursing his wounds, Linda calls Jim out as a weak-kneed, sniveling mouse. Jim goes home, crawls into bed, and that night is visited in a dream by Atlas, the Greek god of strength. Having lost his patience with all the cowardly men on the face of the earth, Atlas teaches Jim a series of secret exercises to build his body and turn him into a magnificent man of might. Jim dons a superhero costume featuring leopard print underpants styled after circus strongmen and takes up the mantle of Atlas. With his newly developed super strength, Jim returns to defeat Duke, win back Linda, and thwart an elaborate gold heist. With the day saved, Jim serves as an example to Andy and the target readership of manly dedication to clean living, proper training, and use for right and justice. And in a stunning turn of events, nobody thought this was an entertaining comic. So it turns out that the story of Atlas was inspired by a guy named Charles Atlas, one of the founding fathers of American bodybuilding and a pioneer of dynamic tension exercises, which are mm. actually featured at the end of the comic. Charles Atlas. Although much of this is speculation, it is generally believed that in the 1940s, a publisher tried to convince real-life Atlas to jump into the comic book business as a way to supplement a series of print advertisements that he had become popular for. A test run for Atlas Comics number 1 was commissioned, and it would even include an introductory message from Charles Atlas himself. For one reason or another, perhaps because the end result was lackluster, Atlas Comics never actually happened. Happened. The comic was never published, and the printing plates were quietly filed away. Well, guess who eventually got their hands on them? Whether they got permission or not isn't clear, but somehow the scrapped comic found its way into the IW catalog, and eventually hit shelves headlining the final issue of Daring 
adventures. It's not not one of the most absurd stories. So regardless of the story's ridiculous origins, it has since fallen into the public domain. You can make your own adaptation of him, and that is what I have done. What sets my atlas apart? I'm glad I asked. Meet Jim Randall, what? a timid and aimless IT guy at Comet Corporation. With the company set to be downsized due to poor performance, corporate sends an assessor by the name of Linda Thompson to rein in Jim's local branch and bring much needed company reform. Stuck without a ride home one evening, Linda's left in the parking lot and Jim shoots his shot, offering to drive her to her apartment on the seedy side of town. There, the two run into Andy getting pulverized by Pug, and Jim finds himself clocked by Butch, a henchman for the mysterious mob boss, Duke Cazzini. After Linda is forced to take matters into her own hands, she dresses Jim down and tells him to hit the road. That night, while in bed licking his wounds, Jim gets visited by Atlas. Damn. That's fucked up and views a ghostly gallery of his life so far, a tale of timidity and cowardice. Jim has done nothing meaningful in his life, and worse, he's too fearful to step up and be a hero when called upon to help those in need. After seeing how pathetic and aimless he's been for the first quarter of his life, Jim gets angry. He knows he's meant to do more with his life than just work at a job he hates, go home, eat potato chips, watch TV, and then die. Atlas convinces him to become the kind of man the world needs. A real man. Someone brave. Someone courageous. A hero. He agrees to train Jim, but only if he's willing to go all the way. Jim wakes up the next morning, redeems three months of unpaid time off, and travels to his uncle's ranch in Arizona, the Crossbar. There he spends an entire summer following Atlas's divine training regimen until he gets straight up jacked. With a new lease on life, Jim travels back home and starts getting his world in order. He joins a fitness club, gets promoted, renovates his house, and even shoots another shot with Linda. But things have gone quite downhill while he's been away. Linda lets slip that Andy is taken up with the Duke's gang, and she fears her little brother is getting in way too deep. Jim visits the bar that the Duke uses as a hideout one night, and after donning the signature costume, breaks in and tries to get Andy to see. Why the fuck did he keep the costume? Uh I need a drink. Where is my tea? Oh, you, did you drink my tea? Did you drink my tea? I'm not gonna stop you, I'm gonna smack your butt though. Oops. Big payday coming by carrying out a special job for the Duke and he bounces, leaving Jim to fight the entire gang all by himself. But hey, no problem for the new Atlas. Jim eventually pieces together the mystery of the Duke's great gold heist, stops a train from exploding, and chases the mob boss down during an Act 3 getaway plane sequence. But don't worry, I won't spoil the ending for you. Because while I said that I spent the last three months writing a script, I also might have spent that time prepping an animated adaptation. I can't let this idea go. So the entire movie has been storyboarded, research and development for characters, and major set pieces is pretty much done. And you know something? I think I'm gonna make this thing. If you all want it, I'm leaving it up to you. It's true, I have designed fully rigged character models for the entire lineup of the Bargain Bin cinematic universe, but it won't Honestly... 
there's too much cheese in it, but I, I know where he's coming from. But after being rejected by somebody, I don't think there'll be much of a future for him because of the rejection. Or them together, them being together. So, it, it, and I think it's a psychological note, I think. Even if you get rejected, even if you get rejected first, then accept it later. It's, um, I believe it's more due to peer pressure than actual, a change of heart. But not to say that that doesn't happen, it's extremely unlikely after first impression. That's the only thing that I'm going to say. In my experience, anyway. So I jumped up today to the cold embrace of existential dread as I realized I was going to be recording some Skull today and would most likely be searching for Lich, Gambler, anything new that I'm supposed to be showing you guys and realizing that that's probably not going to be the case and seeing as how it's currently 10 p.m. and I haven't finished my recording yet and I don't have any of those Skulls, I bet you can guess how this is going to go. Yeah, it's a Rockstar run today. I'm sorry I still don't have the good stuff, but you know what? I do have some good stuff, including Infinite Boner as the first <laughs> item I got in the run. Now, you would be surprised how many and how often I do runs where I get some insane legendary items, but no good skulls to use, and I ditch a lot of these runs. But I haven't actually had Infinite Bone in a long time. At least it doesn't feel like I've had one in a long time. So... I'm going to do it, dude. Let's just go. I want to go with this boner and, and go. And <laughs> I want to go and see how it works. Mage's Necklace, Ceremonial Dagger, The Rockstar. He's got outro along with amp, but he always has amp. So, I mean, yeah, that's just the way it's going to work. Now, I expect this to be a blow up. As soon as you've got infinite bone plus some half decent magic stuff on Rockstar, which I'm not going to lie, dude. With these three items, you could probably just upgrade Rockstar and go straight to the end of the run and it could be a big winner just the way that it is he's just that powerful he's an s tier for a reason hello pike i will take these fragments now uh let's move on and oh look it's yggdrasil time let's go do yigs oh no it's happening the Carlean Church have finally used their nefarious futuristic hacking methods to sneak into the Demon King's network. All of our data is at risk. Great googly woogly. They've begun stealing all of our precious skull coin. No. Thankfully, this video's sponsor is here to say with Surfshark. And mining skull to get this incredible I hate Google. commercials, I'm sorry. Ugh. And another big thanks to Surfshark again for sponsoring this video. And that's the story about how I was almost paralyzed at 12 years old. Anyway, moving on, uh, Clown Surprise Box. Do not care that much about Clown Surprise Box, but hey, we've got it. We'll make do with it. 36 bone fragments and counting. This is pretty decent. Uh, even if I don't have my band from using it on the boss fights, we're just going to shred melt and ultimately look, look at the decimation here yeah, this is insane i i can't believe how strong rockstar still is like i expected a pretty big nerf and making him unique was kind of a nerf to just you know how often you can find him and how many rockstar runs you'll get but let's be real just a rarity change nah he's still insanely strong dude insanely strong and that's not even with good items right now. We've kind of just, you know, we've just started. I am looking forward to doing some some real work annihilating the rest of this place. No, stop that, dude. My God. I was thinking about it the other day because people were talking about, like, I still uh, go back and check comments for videos and things as often as I can. So even older videos, and I, I still get comments occasionally on older videos. I recently had one on my skull only my very first, like, fresh save file run that I did uh, only a few weeks ago when I, I started a, a fresh save to kind of show you guys how I would do a run without all the witch traits and all the extra things. 
and I have comments on there saying, dude, I, I wouldn't be able to do this even if I had all the traits and, and legendary skulls and all the best items. Like, how are you doing this? And a big part of it is just, you know, how long I've been playing the game. I've been playing Skull for ages now. I'm well over 800 hours. I'm like 820 hours or so, I think, in the game. But it got me thinking how much of the game I do actually play kind of on autopilot where like this room for example i'm just kind of running through this room and none of those items are anything that i want but it's at a point now where i can just kind of like talk and chat casually and do anything i really want and not worry too much about what's happening behind me i might summon the band in this room actually let's just summon the band let them take care of this oh okay that wasn't necessary it was a complete and total waste because the last of them died straight away hello ghoul I want to do another ghoul run at some point. I know I know back when the, when ghoul first got his big changes, people were already getting sick of it because I did like six ghoul runs on stream in like the same stream and people are like, please, please, Beals, stop it. Ah, oh, it's Warlock with Orb and Beam. Uh, no Meteor, no, sorry. No! no. I could re-roll for it, but it's 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 already Rockstar, dude. Let it, let, it, let it be alone. Leave it alone. Uh... Oh, the Rockstar theme. Yay. Yay. And I don't have my, my band to jam with now because I decided to use it right before the adventurer fight. Thankfully, Rockstar doesn't even need a band. He can be a solo act if need be. Uh, get ready to drop money into his hat because he's busking his way to glory as he rock slams, jams, and wham bams his way through these. Thank you. I wasn't sure where to go with that and I was waiting desperately for it to end. Hello, Pot of Greed. <laughs> yeah, I'll take Pot of Greed. There's nothing else there that's too too impressive of a Pot of Greed. Uh, great. So, absolute minimum by the time we get Rockstar to Legendary. We'll be at three stacks for a nice 45% damage boost. I'll take it, dude. I'm, I'm quite happy to take take it. Uh, God, I love um, the bone, dude. Infinite bone is just so handy, dude. It's so good. It's so everything. It's It's... It's va 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 voom, you know? It's ooh la la. It's, it's all the best things that you could want in a basic utility item, which isn't all that basic. It's actually fantastic and legendary, and you should always take it for virtually every single character, all the time. The boots don't help us at all because Rockstar is a magical boy with the power of magical riffs and, and sick shreds and amazing key structure and... and he doesn't need that physical nonsense hit die i will i will dominate you i will i will uh, i will show dominance as i dominate da die die slam jam Woo! let him slide across the ground <laughs> dude i didn't mean to do that i wasn't watching my meter it's okay though it's still early we've got the shop coming up and i can i can probably stall some time in here the iron shoes of bitter cold the hate stone i'm gonna do that thing where i try to not just narrow in on all tactics items and i might do some other stuff now something that rockstar is actually quite good at is triggering like uh on hit effects and effects that trigger based on damage that he deals so like blizzard he's actually very good at doing blizzard related stuff should i take water instead of minotaur lake of the spirits that's actually a pretty good one for him yeah let's do that lake of the spirits is pretty nice and water boy is another very obviously powerful s tier type skull who is going to do a lot of damage and just be insanely good and awesome and wonderful and i know that dropping the water on the ground and then immediately swapping out doesn't do too much but to be honest dude i'm just looking for an excuse to throw out damage and and swap and do cool stuff we can just do whatever we want for the most part with this kind of a run like there are there are no rules anymore there are no rules the only rule is uh actually you know what i'm gonna take issue with that this is gonna be one of those weird times where I stop and I point out like like a paradox that bothers me on a constant level. When people say the only rule is there are no rules, and I you know how it's like the joke is that, you know, well that's a rule though, so if the only rule is that there are no rules, but that rule in itself is a rule, then that, that counteracts the fact that there are no rules. There in fact is a big rule. Even if that rule is that there are no rules, it in itself is still a rule. And I, uh, I don't I don't hate like like a dumb pet peeve. I just think it's funny that people that that English and language in itself has stupid things like that. It's like ah, you've been caught out, dude. There's actually rules. <laughs> what a nerd. 
What a what a buffoon! What a complete and total stupid idiot! I I bet you watch X Arm, don't you? How dare you, you you <laughs> low low taste stupid peasant person? Ha ha ha! Gotcha. <laughs> I love I love stupid stuff like. You're making a business. I'm interested. Tell me more. Don't make me shay. Use my awkward voice. Come on. You really want to start a store business. The first thing you need to do is decide what type of product you're going to be selling and how you're going to be moving it. The easiest one would be uh, selling t-shirts and logo uh, uh, with uh, specialized logo designs of your own creation. And selling, and selling them at uh, competitive rates on pretty much on demand on demand, at least low volume demand, high volume, uh, with a high volume wait list, waiting list. And all of that can be, all of that can be handled uh, with a website and uh, some type of partner, uh, some type of partnership where you like create your own logos and design uh, logos and designs elsewhere, and sell it and sell it through a parent site. What? What? No, I can't give you a hug. You weenie. Well, then I guess you got to stand up, right? You in my room. Hold on. What you want to do is start off small with low risk and uh, low risk investments. Minimize the risk and establish yourself as far as uh, as far as potential investing is concerned. Then you work your way up to bigger and bigger things. No matter what your niche, niche or pitch is going to be, if you don't have anything locked on, nothing to, no plan. Nobody's going to buy into your idea and invest in it. So you want something that's marketable. You want something that's tangible as far as goods that you have or uh, services rendered. And you go forward from there. Otherwise, you have nothing to trade for other people's money, capital, or anything else. I can't give you the answers. I only can give you uh, suggestions. Are you trying to sneak this? Is this a butt? Is this a butt cheek? No, it's Ava. <laughs> Come here. Don't, uh uh. Oh my god. 
do I meet with your foes? Starting with being your patrol. Is it going to be good? No, I gave you a hug, and you tried to get me an ambush. Me a what? You tried to ambush me. <laughs> Don't do that. I'll slap you. Uh, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, my one trying to bite me. So what type of messed up crap is that? Well, what happens if you make me angry? Hmm? What happens if you make me angry? You, you, you going to get beat up by your daddy? I love you, baby girl, but don't do that because you don't like me. Do you understand? You got to treat people with respect if you want to get. The problem with that is you don't have the financial backing nor the resources available that Walmart already has. And again... You're starting off at the beginning, so you're going to only be like one, one commercial, uh, one, one store versus uh, versus comparably in size to all the rest of uh, of the WalMarts. What you need to do is research how. Any successful franchise first started and realize that if you get other people invested in what you're doing and attract people with more money than you to your operation where they want to recreate this, this success elsewhere, you're no longer spending your money. They're spending theirs. That's what you want to do. That's the type of buy-in that you want to accomplish for yourself. Like, say, you want to make a store, but you don't want it to be any type of store. All right, fine. Well, what is your favorite stuff? Well, I like drinking, so what do you have to order? Okay, go ahead. Yes, but still have... That's too far, uh, that's too far in advance. What you need to look at, what you need to look at is more along the lines of that. Uh, more along the lines of this. Any success is shared between several pe uh, several people, and for like a single investor investing in something, uh, investing their money in something, they want to see ten percent. They want to see ten percent dividends on a, not dividends. They want to see ten percent of their money back on a monthly basis. The, uh, the figure will change depending on how much we're actually talking about. If we're talking about hundreds of thousands to actual millions, um, the calculations are going to get skewed, not in favor. But if you're talking about just small business, depending on where you live, what the people, uh, what the people of the local area like, I'll suggest just making a small business family owned and operated so that you can maintain tight control and quality over the things that you uh, over the things that you produce and make it uh and make it affordable so that people with not so much cash can get 
some of the low-hanging fruit that you provide. Like say, for example, I'll put together a brewery and brewery. No, blah, 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 blah. Hold on. Brewery. Because, because the only thing you need is yeast, sugar, and um, water. And you can buy the fruits, vegetables, the hops, and everything else like that. You can buy things to supplement what you want to do. And you can still make uh, freaking different thing, uh, different things or up the alcohol content so that now you have pharmacy-grade freaking alcohol. Everyone likes cars, games, shoes, clothes, and yeah, but everybody needs a car to get from one place to another for long distances. A games are a pleasant distraction from the foolishness that goes on, so most people would buy into that. Um, shoes so that you ain't running barefooted on hot or cold freaking surfaces so shoes and boots is an idea which you should tuck away for later because everyone needs a pair and everybody well the three things that everybody needs food food and drink clothing and a place to live Everyone's a hoe where you live. Don't don't look at people like that. Even though I look down on people too on my worst days, it's not because I know them or don't know them. You got to realize that people are untapped but unregulated resource of full of potential. And you can tap into that resource and get revenue from it. You got to look at everybody like a potential customer that's willing to drop money into your pocket. You can't just, you know, belittle and freaking say things about people that you'll regret later because that will get back to you. You treat people with respect even though that they don't deserve it and you treat yourself with respect. But if you want to tap into if you want to tap into the market of your local area about everybody loves cars, games, and shoes. Pick out the uh, pick out the style of shoes that you would like to, to to supply to everybody to wear. Pick out the type of games and car accessories 
that everybody would like to have from the fuzzy handcuffs. I mean, wait, uh, from the fuzz, uh, from the fuzzy dice hanging from the from <laughs> in the rearview mirror, or <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> Uh, or anything else. Just set up a like a small shop. Make it homey, make it quaint, make it to the point so that people come in and know what the fuck they're looking at and then roll out. And make sure that your signage reflects what the shop is about or what the shop is about. Because if they say if they come in and it's about car stuff, uh, uh, your st- about car stuff and car accessories, and they're like, "Can you replace my engine?" And the guy goes, "No, we're just car accessories, man. If you need like placemats, you need uh, air uh, air fresheners, something to wipe down your car with." To uh, to just the paint, uh, just a regular paint job and exter- exterior detail work. Fine, bring it in, but we don't actually fix your car. Stuff like that, real specific to the point. Get as many people in and out as possible. That's it. Oh, Jesus, excuse me. Uh, that, that really that really makes me happy, dude. It really brings home the, the good vibes. Can you please, lady? I do need more damage. Sorry though, for the rain. Considered. I do still need to get the jam going. I need to be blowing up these dudes a lot I do faster. like this game, also, but I can't I play to, it uh, the way Thank people either. for the, the good reception. Um, by the time you see this, the, the other one, the other video for... Ah... Uh, Astral Ascent will most likely be out and be viewable and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've seen I've seen some of the reception to it already. It's it's absolutely fantastic, and I'm I'm looking forward to doing more Astral Ascent stuff, even in very early access like it is. Uh, people are going to be asking, "Hey, Beals, are you going to do more Astral Ascent?" Yes, I will. Don't worry. I've done one more run since the recording of that video and have already discovered a whole bunch of extra stuff that I didn't think was even in early access, but we'll get to that when we get to that. But just to answer any people who are questionable on it, yes, we'll be doing some more Astral Ascent. Do not worry, have no fear. Is that double? Is that triple lakes on the ground right now? That, madam, is actually illegal. Gonna now drop all this right here. Yes, the idea was to use the band to blow up the first sister. I'm not... This is technically a waste, but the whole idea was for the band to kill her in phase one anyway. So, I mean, yes, they didn't really do their job because Rockstar did his job so well on his own that I don't worry, dude, I get it. Now, part of what I was saying before about how I'm kind of like on an on autopilot sequence, I was reminded of it when people are talking about how well I handle the sisters fight where they're like, dude, I can be paying full concentration to what I'm doing and still not do the sisters. And d- dude, if, if you're that person, do not think that you're like bad or that you know um you should stop playing or that you know you're you're, you're sucky or whatever it it was exactly the same way for me for a long time the sisters required concentration required uh planning and 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 for me to realize what i needed to do for each attack as they were coming out and i would i still get hit all the time but that's mostly just because i'm distracted or i'm being lazy with my dodges but it's just basically a reminder to all of you that I've been playing Skull now for a long time. And the Sisters fight has not changed once since I picked up the game. The Yggdrasil fight never used to have Phase 2 when he when he dies and comes back extra, extra angy. Legendary Rockstar, by the way. Yeah! Um, but Yggdrasil never used to have that second phase. The Chimera fight changed very, very, very minorly. But besides that, the, the rest of it is exactly the same as it, as it was in Early Access. So all of my knowledge with Early Access and the way the game play just carries over one-to-one easy-peasy um, and allows me to 
well, I don't know, just do what I've always done. So don't think that you're bad. Don't think that you're bad or anything. And for the love of God, if you're farming quartz or you're worried about, you know, the grind in the game and the difficulty curb and everything, turn on rookie mode. Please go into your options and turn on rookie mode. If it's becoming, if it's becoming so much of an issue that it's like killing the fun for you, please turn on rookie mode. It's, it's pretty much what it's there for is to help you get through some of the early parts of the game if it's too tough for you kind of thing. Just do that. Uh, but besides all of that, I see slime! Yo, I see slime boy here. Let me drop this down on top of you. And I come over here and kill you. Lovely, lovely. Uh, die. Do I even have anything I don't want? Oh, yeah, I do. I have this that I don't want. I have this that I don't want. I have this that I don't want. And I have this that I don't want. Pretty much half my inventory I didn't want. Ha ha ha, I didn't realize at the time. Slime, give me double infinite bone. That would be the sexiest thing you could do for me. Uh, you know, second place sexy is still second most beautiful in, in, in the eyes of those who are uh, contrarians. So it's fine. Let's go with that. Let's go with the double ceremonial dagger. Now we're dual wielding. Double the dagger. Triple the pleasure. That is Sword Boy. Do I have... No. I was going to say Sword Blade Slash. I might have taken it just because I really miss my Sword Blade Slash. In a flame, not really going to get much use out of that on this run. I'm not going to be swapping too much. Nether Mana Suppressor. Thank you. I will take this. Did I say I was avoiding tactics at the start of this? Because um, tactics isn't avoiding me. Tactics isn't avoiding me. I'm not going to reroll. That's going to be a bit much. That's Wraith. Yes. Yes. Gates of the Netherworld. Nah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it for now. Save the money. Look for something more dangerous in regards to a quintessence. Maybe? Ooh, speaking of maybes, maybes. Let me get this music out right now. Jamming on them. Oh, it's disgusting. It, the, the room... This 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 room is clear. And that's not clear yet. I was going for a this room is clear bit, but... Ah, this room is now clear. And I've got all my life back, so I don't need to talk to the halfling girl. I've rescued her. Don't, don't at me, all right? All of you people who are all like, Bill, you didn't rescue the little halfling girl. You're a monster. You're such a demon. I hate your brand. You suck. I rescued her, okay? I, I rescued her. It's fine. I didn't talk to her, though. Because if I, if I leave her, if I wait, I might need her later on. And I, I can benefit from her later on. All right, that oh, no, actually worked. I was going to say that didn't work out how I wanted to, but it did. It did. Rockstar's outro, his like electric slide, his electric slide, is is such such an underestimatedly great move, dude. The fact that it doubles as damage and mobility, it's just so handy. He used to be, and I think I mentioned this in every Rockstar video I do. He used to be the speedrun skull when he came out. Because he used to be rare level quality, like he wasn't a unique, he was a rare. You could get him from the Fox NPC at the very start of your runs. Now, bear in mind, when 1.0 came out, Rockstar didn't really get any nerfs or adjustments to his power. Besides the fact that 1.0 released legendary forms, imagine unique Rockstar from the very, very, very beginning of your run. And the big difference is there is only the Chimera fight at the end, and that's it. There's only three acts. With Rockstar running through, doing insane damage, and just jamming his way through the entire run, you can see how fast he was able to go. I think some of my fastest runs in early access, was it like 12 minutes, 12 or 13 minutes? Which is disgusting, by the way, because that's how long speed runs are now. That's like the leading... The, the, the run, that's like the world record run right now, is like a 13 minute run, which is embarrassing for people like me who've been playing the game for a long time, but very much RNG dependent, and they're all dead. Amazing. Thank you, Rockstar, for being disgusting. Uh, Medusa! This is exactly what I like in my quintessences. I might take Medusa instead. I could break the fragments, go upgrade Waterboy to Unique. I don't really care though this is about rockstar some relatively fast runs but they were all thanks to rockstar and he's he's hasn't changed since he's just gotten stronger with his new form it's disgusting how how good this lad is and i i always recommend him I, um shout outs to kia uh very verbal about rockstar being kia's absolute favorite character and i i have no issues with that i can completely understand why um what am i after anymore 
uh, besides, like, I've, I've kind of got everything I need. I have some damage, you know, with, with what we've got here. We've got damage, we've got utility. Now, the build is almost finished, and... Yeah, okay, mana bone. Wait. Power and speed, I don't have... You know what? I'm going to do the contrarian thing. I'm going to do what no one else in the situation would do. I'm going to avoid the free tactics damage boosting item because I don't have any balanced skulls. And I'm going to re-roll it out, and I'm going to look for some other stuff. Now, Rockstar is one of those skulls that can't benefit from attack speed whatsoever. It is the fine print at the bottom of his description of all of what he does right there, which means things like anything Madness and Berserker's Gauntlet is useless. So if you see me avoiding items like that, or even if, you know, Pain and Despair decides to drop, you know why, just for, the, you know, all however many of you who haven't seen or played Rockstar before and don't know what this guy's about. Actually, a Mage's Mana Brace... Uh, I'm doomed. Evan Edo. By saying tricky, listen, I know it's our first time talking. I promise you, I'm not a furry. <laughs> I, I swear, I, like I'm a normal dude. Evan, as Gandhi once said, "You are who you smash." I. You've been picking every furry. <gasps> I, I don't. Coincidence. <laughs> I hate it here, dude. I really do. <laughs> I don't okay. want to win, win this one. one. I don't want to win. I'm gonna. I'm throwing. Evan Ito, the man with the most basic taste I've ever seen, and also maybe a furry. Versus <laughs> Tricky, the one that smashed God. Evan, would you like to select the first Pokemon you smash? Oh, are you gonna pick a furry? Let's see if I win this. Right, people mm -hmm. will never let this down. Yeah. So let me, I, I want to intentionally throw here. Okay, okay, Garchomp. Garchomp! Garchomp! Garchomp. All right, Evan, why would you smash Garchomp? <laughs> you? Um, honestly, all right, I got fucked by Garchomp when I played um, Diamond, so I feel like a lot of people want to fuck Garchomp back, so. <laughs> honestly, I, I respect it. The logic is sound. Garchomp has 1,600 entries on Rule 34. It's hate fucking. That's a lot what of people is? that uh, lost to Cynthia in at the end of Diamond. All right, Tricky. Uh, okay, I know I'm gonna lose. This is good. This is good. This is what I want. Wait, wait, exactly wait. no! Want. Don't this you fucking try this. <laughs> 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 okay, I got this. All right, Deoxys. Oh, baby! Smashing are, God. Are you... That's just step one. Are... Deoxys has. 176 entries. I'm really Let's surprised. Go! I thought for sure Deoxys would have more. Tricky! Yay! Don't do this Tentacle to me! Tentacle arms! No. At least Deoxys is humanoid, unlike some of the others Evan has on his list. But I'm, I'm referring to the ones that stand on all fours specifically. That might uh, be canines. You picked four-legged canines, Evan? Tricky, Evan. I'm making it a longer right now. Evan? <laughs> yeah. Evan? <laughs> yeah. Evan? Listen. Evan? Listen. Listen. Okay. First of all, all right. You have to understand. You know, sometimes if you really look at them, they just look kind of cute. It's like when you look at a husky and huskies. You want to smash adorable. huskies? No, I don't want to smash a husky. <laughs> no, I don't want to smash a husky. I'm just oh saying. Oh my god, bro. I'm just, I'm just trying to. Nice I'm just. No, I'm just trying to. Smash a husky. I hate it here, dude. All <laughs> right, Evan. Well, anywho, pick a Pokemon you want to smash. <laughs> intentionally throwing because I don't want to win this challenge. All right, all right. Mr. Mime. Mr. What? Mime. Evan, you've I, gone ahead I'm and living. selected the straight up worst Pokemon of all time. I, I need to lose. Mr. I need Mime to lose. I can't. Evan, so can you explain much. to me why you would smash Mr. Mime? I wouldn't. That's, that's, He's, on no one would. He's on your okay, list. He's on your list of 10 Pokemon okay, you would smash. Listen, Ash's mom would Sma smash yes. Mr. Ash's Mr. Mime. I Mr. Mr. Cannot, Mr. Yes, yeah, canonically, yes. If she's, you know, still with him, obviously, that means that like he has a good like you know mime game so like i'm trying to like get in on that right I'm trying to figure out like you know what he's doing like maybe he's like forming because he, he you know he doesn't like have like a member down there right this is not so like maybe better. he's like but mr mime strangely enough has 124 entries on rule 34. let's go tricky I'd love to Can see you, you love top to see this let's see cradilly oh my god <laughs> Oh my god. No! Cradley only has 72 entries on oh, their no! No! no way! No! Get no! This is fantastic! What? What? <laughs> I am not going to win. win. Congratulations, win. Evan. No! I'm oh so proud god. of you, Evan. And you did it all without even picking the final Pokemon in your list, Arcanine. You have many... Arcanine? Okay, listen, list? again, you have to you have to understand. Arcanine looks What do you mean I don't understand? It's a fucking dog! No, it's not a dog, it's a 
tiger. Oh my god, Arcanine thing. has 5,000 entries on roll 34. I might actually what? be a furry. I feel like this has been a learning experience for everyone involved. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. I listen, I don't want to be known like this though. Now, can we just blur my face for the entire video and like you know, my voice be like, uh, nah. editor, editor son, can you please like put like tags, like just tag him everywhere? I feel like he deserves it. He worked so hard to get here. Pass tournament. Mario, <laughs> because the furries love those. 87 entries on rule 34. Impressive. Hmm. There's a restaurant? Well, ladies and gentlemen, color me surprised. <laughs> All right. I don't know how to start that conversation. I would call her up. But good Lord. Let me see. Extreme randomize and that means All right, right now, I'm going to just go ahead and take a break. I'm going to be back on later on. We're going to play a game or do some art. So, I'm sorry about the inconvenience, but it's the way it is.
and things will never be the same.